Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. In nearly all cultures, myths and legends can serve as cautionary tales, keeping one foot in practical reality and the other in the realm of the supernatural. And it's no surprise that the most effective cautionary tales are also the scariest. The ancient lore of the indigenous peoples of North America are as varied and far-reaching as the continent itself, and unless you're well-versed in native lore, you might not realize how many of those tales are populated by horrifying spirits, ghosts, witches, demons, and monsters. And since I'm in the scare business, I'm here to share some of the most nightmarish. We'll look at Native American legends, myths, lore, and monsters that span multiple tribes, and in some cases, hundreds of generations. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Museum. Affiliated stations present Escape. All of fantasy. Inner Sanctum Mystery. Lights out. Murder. At midnight. The Sealed Book. Presents. I am the whistler. Welcome, Weirdos. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness Retro Radio. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved and unexplained. And in between the stories, I bring you some of the best dark, creepy, and horrifying old-time radio shows from what I've collected over the years. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, sign up for my free newsletter, connect with me on social media, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... G. Marshall. Welcome to the world of terrifying imagination, to the world of enchantment, spells, bewitchery. These are all words from our childhood, pleasant memories of nursery stories before bedtime. The dark side of magic we knew nothing of, and when we grew old enough to learn, dismissed as ignorance and superstition. But once again in our times, incantation, exorcism, and the haunting belief in demonic possession are alive and abroad. They are what this strange tale is about. I tell you, Doctor, it's the God's honest truth. They brought the young man in on the rolling stretcher to the emergency room, and he had this big sort of dent in his head. Oh, he didn't look like he was breathing at all. He was me with me bucket and me pail, trying to clean up. Just me and the young man on the stretcher and the old wine old Peter we call PJ. 
they brought him earlier, slurring and dribbling. And that's when it happened. Came right out of old PJ's mouth and across the room and right off the young man's mouth like that. With a bony, cindery smell like the old scissor grinder stone wheel used to make. Oh, a great black cloud with red eyes in the middle and a long, thought tail. Oh, I've taken all of it on me, mother's grave. It was the devil himself. <laughs> Our mystery drama, Possessed by the Devil, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Donald Buca. It is sponsored in part by Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule, and Anheuser Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. <laughs> From the beginnings of history, it is there in some form. Possession. The incubus who ravishes maidens while asleep. The succubus who tempts man into seduction in his dreams. The dibuk, that lost soul who dies before his time and is compelled to wander in space till he can steal a body to live out his allotted years. Fact? Superstition? Hallucination? Here is such a modern legend. You be the judge. Okay, Doctor, an IV setup for old Wally Wino here, glucose. So started right away. Yes, Dr. Daniels. Oh, he don't look like he's long for this world. <laughs> he hasn't got a cell. He hasn't drowned in alcohol. His liver is like a washboard. But I'm not sure I concur with your diagnosis, Mrs. Gideon. No, I don't know this time. Well, oh, another emergency. And this is supposed to be the quiet hour. Uh, do you want me to get out for a while, Doctor? I, I, I'm near finished. No, no, go ahead with your cleaning. Uh, just don't get run over by the stretcher. Uh, uh, put him over here, boys. Now, what have you brought me this time? Oh, you poor old souse. Dead to the world's the word for you, all right. Oh, still got me sympathy. With my arthritis, many's the time I've been tempted to have a go at the hard stuff myself. Oh, but thanks to sweet Mary, she's held me back. A little sacramental wine to ease me bones keeps me going. I had a few tonight, I can tell you. Oh, but there's always them breath sweeteners to take it away. I hope. Well, how's your patient, Mrs. Gideon? Oh, Doctor, I hope he's not a Catholic. The father might never make it in time. How's yours? Oh, mine's out of my league. What I need is a brain surgeon. Huh. Speak of the devil. Considine just walked past the door. Uh, Dr. Considine? Uh, Dr. Considine, sir, I've got an emergency here. Oh, my heaven. And me here alone with two more corpses. <laughs> I didn't see it. I couldn't laugh. Oh, but I did. I see it. Oh, the good saints preserve me. Hey, hey, hey there, Mother. Well, where am I? Oh, I... In, in the Mercy Hospital. Huh? Oh, you shouldn't be getting up. Oh, ma'am. You're sure a different kind of nurse. Oh, I'm... <laughs> I'm no nurse. I'm the cleaning woman. Oh, and you hadn't oughtn't to be sitting up? Not with that clout on the head someone's after giving you. Hmm? What clout on the head? Why, that great big dent as big as a soap plate they brought you in with. <laughs> what are you talking about? You, I'm late for the operating room already. Dr. Considine, he has a depressed skull fracture. I don't even know if he's still alive. <sighs> Good Lord, what are you doing on your feet? Dr. Considine, will you help me get him back on the... Hey, hey, hold up. Wait a minute. Now, look, there's nothing wrong with me. Mister, an ambulance just brought you in here with a skull fracture. You were out cold in deep shock. But there's nothing wrong. There's nothing the matter with my head. Look. Holy mother. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Uh, uh, Mike. Uh, Michael Damon. Oh, well, I'm uh, Dr. Considine, Chief of Neurological Surgery here at the hospital. Would you mind uh, sitting down on this chair for a second and letting me check you out? <laughs> sure, Doc. Look, I've got to admit, I don't remember how I got here to the hospital, so 
Maybe you ought to have a look at me. Uh, Mrs. Gideon, what's the matter with you? You look like you just saw a ghost. It wasn't no ghost, sir. It Dr. Was... Daniels, get over here. Uh, yes, sir. Would you mind casting your eagle eye over the back of this young man's head and show me one scintilla of evidence of skull fracture or concussion? Doctor, all I know is Jake Bronstein brought him in on the wagon and he had a decompressed area you could have laid your hand in. That's right, sir. I saw it myself. Someone here has been drinking. Daniels, look. If this is your idea of a joke, I... Uh, but but... Uh, no, never mind. We'll, uh, we'll discuss this later. Mr. Damon? Yes, Doctor? For your own protection as well as the hospital's, may I suggest that we take some x-rays of your head? Oh, nurse. Yes? You can let Dr. Daniels take over on the IV with the old man. And we'll, Mr. Damon, straight to x-ray. I want a full set of head plates. Yes, Doctor. Now, Mr. Damon, there are, there are a couple of questions I'd like to ask you. Uh, excuse me, sir. Dad? Mike? Are you all right, son? Oh, I feel fine, Dad, except for a headache. Oh, uh, Dr. Considine, this is my father, Reverend Damon. Oh, uh, how do you do? A nurse, can we get going? Yes, sir. Uh, Dad, what happened? Uh, how did I get here? Well, perhaps you can explain, Reverend, as we walk along. I want to get to X-ray. Well, I wish someone could explain to me what happened. I can, sir. Uh, let me check the IV on old PJ. Uh, wait a minute. What is it, Doctor? P.J. here. He's bought it this time. Oh. oh, this is not my night. We might have pulled him through. Oh, there's going to be the devil to pay around here. Oh, you can say that again. It's the God's truth, Dr. Considine. Came right out of the old man's mouth and across the room and up the young man's nose like that. With a burning, cindery smell like the old scissor grinder's wheel used to make. A great black cloud with red eyes in the middle. And a long, forked tail. Oh, I'd take an oath on me mother's grave towards the devil himself. Yeah, yes, yes, Mrs. Gideon, I think you uh, can leave the medical discussion to us. And I'm sure you have important work waiting. Oh, bless us. I, I left me pail and mop there. Oh, I hope nobody's been after stealing that mop. It had a brand new head on it. Well, at least I know now where the smell of alcohol came from. I can't blame you for that, Daniel. Sure. But I just can't accept it. In an emergency room, you concentrate on a seemingly healthy patient while you lose a really sick old man. P.J. was a repeater, Doc. He's long overdue for uremic poisoning or cardiac arrest. But this young guy, Damon... Well, 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 complete your sentence. Oh, I was just thinking... That magnificent body, physically way above par, and the injury I thought I saw, well, would have left him a vegetable for the rest of a long life if we'd pulled him through. What injury? That depressed fracture. Most of the brain should have been injured beyond repair. You say what you thought you saw. Apparently you didn't see anything. You heard Mrs. Gideon back me up, Doctor. Come in. Oh, it's the wet plates, Doctor, from X-ray. Uh, light up the viewing fields, Daniels, and let's have a good look. Yeah, satisfied? Well, sir... Oh, somebody gave him a knock on the head, all right. There's some exterior evidence of that, but of any fracture? None I can see. Well, you're the doctor of record. Shall we send him home? I see no reason not to. Okay. Now I'd better get up to O.R. Coming! Coming! Trudy! Well, don't look so disappointed, Rod. Come, come in. Give me that. <laughs> Say, sweetheart, what are you doing here at this hour? Oh, I couldn't sleep after your call, so I drove over. Is Mike back from the hospital? No, I thought the bell was Dad and Mike. They're on the way home right now. How come you didn't go to the hospital? Oh, well, we've been trying to get in touch with Anton Azarak. Oh? So Dad thought one of us should be here in case he called back. Oh. I mean, to find out what happened. 
Yeah. All right, Janda. Cool it. Oh, what a name for a cat. Why, oh, I see nothing wrong with it. I think a martyr belongs in a minister's family. Oh, is that my fate as your wife to be? Of course not. <laughs> we just called her that because Mike and she never seem to get along. Well, that's hard to figure about the cat. Mike is such a kind, gentle sort of a giant. I, I thought all animals loved him. Well, it depends what the word includes. Oh, wait a minute, there's a car now. The return of the prodigal son. Now maybe we'll find out just what happened last night. And that's honestly all I can tell any of you. You were making a fresh fire in the fireplace at half past five in the morning and straightened up too fast and knocked yourself cold on the underside of the mantelpiece? Well, what other explanation is there, Rod? Well, it is solid oak. And that big, round, ornamental sphere is a menace. I've regretted it every time I've bumped my own head on it. Yeah, but, Dad, you never hit your head hard enough to knock yourself cold. Mike, why were you making a fire at that time in the morning? Well, I wasn't actually making one. I was replacing one. Uh, Professor Azarek was, was with me last night, coaching me for an exam I have coming up, and... Uh... Well, he got cold. Oh, come on. It wasn't cold enough for a fire last night. Well, maybe when you went to bed, but we were up all night. And the professor's a pretty old man. What were you doing up at that hour in the morning, Dad? Well, I really don't know. Something woke me and I... Are you all right, Reverend Chase? Oh, excuse me, Trudy, dear. Yes, uh, yes, I'm fine. I'm just recalling that moment this morning. How vivid it was. I was startled out of the depths of my sleep to wide awakeness. I had a vision of Mike surrounded by flames. It was so real, I even said a little prayer. Then I hopped out of bed, went to the window. It wasn't very dark anymore. And looking across, I could see that all the studio lights were on and the front door open. And I... Thought I'd better go and have a look. And when you got there, you found Mike on the floor unconscious? Yes. Lying on his face, white as a sheet, and deathly cold. Oh. Yeah, but what made you call the hospital? It's not like you to panic. Well, uh, I realized that, but, but the back of his head looked as though he'd been felled by some superhuman male fist. It, it was all bent, bent inward. I thought the hospital said Mike was all right. Oh, I am, Trudy. A clean bill of health. Nothing to worry about. Uh, my fault. It must have been an illusion, of course. Well, I think if the Inquisition is over, I'm going to make up on some sleep. Hmm? Oh, that damn cat! I'd forgotten about her. Will you keep her in there away from me? What's the matter with her? It's been a very strange night and morning. And I have a hauntingly uneasy feeling. You mean about Mike? About Mike. I hope the hospital was right to give him a clean bill of health. He doesn't seem himself at all. Not at all. Hello. Hello. Azarek. Michael. What the hell happened last night? Okay, okay. Not on the phone. I'm going to rest now. But you be sure to be here tonight. So far in our modern legend, we have caught up with superstition, witches, magic, both black and white, enchantment, spells, abracadabra. Well, there are two more acts to come. I'll be back very shortly with Act Two. young man rushed to the hospital with a depressed fracture of the skull, which should have mangled his brain. A chronic drunken repeater back in emergency on the edge of fatal acute alcoholism. And an aging cleaning woman who thought she saw a malign spirit pass from the drunk to the young man. Now, apparently in full health, we'll be able to appraise just how healthy the young man who made his remarkable recovery is. Be right there. Professor Azarek, 
please. Come here. And must you be so formal? After last night and today, I'm taking no chances. Maybe with your superior intelligence, you have no worries about our abortive attempt at Satanism. But I have. Look, I was the victim, and since a crack on the head denied me any knowledge of what happened, I'm only hoping you can give me the straight goods. Uh, the straight goods. A peculiarly inept term for what we are engaged in, my brother in Satan. Damn it, it's not a deal in semantics, Anton. Now, what happened after I summoned up the fiend? I mean, how did you escape, and how could I have been harmed? As long as I was safe in the magic triangle within the circle. I warned you to keep your feet still. If you touch any part of the circle itself or the triangle within it, you are at the mercy of all the devils in hell. And if I'd known what I was getting into when I picked your philosophy course, I'd have quit. You made the mistake of not realizing how vulnerable your soul was as the son of a minister. All right, all right. I'm not crying over what happened. I just want to know what it was. Now, where was I? By the fireplace, lying prostrate. The way you fell after he hit you. Who hit me? The devil you summoned. But where did he appear? Outside the circle here. The inner or the outer? Beyond the outer, of course. There was water scattered between the circles. And the wolfsbane scattered through it. And within the circle, you had the brazier burning. Everything as you ordered it and arranged it. Yes, but... But what went wrong? Your ego. My ego? What does that mean? You lost your head. Or at least almost did. This was a simple experiment by someone who seemed a true psychic to raise a minor antichrist. The motive was strong enough to create belief. Or at least the hope of belief. You wanted a familiar to procure your brother's woman for you. Beshal, you were to call forth. Why did you call on Ashtaroth, a giantess beyond your control? I... I don't know. But do I have to explain? No, no. Ever since you became my disciple... You told me that you have lusted after the woman your brother brought home as his bride. The only thing I've never been able to take from Rod whenever I wanted. When you finished the incantation and summoned Ashtaroth, I thought the house would come down about our ears. The earth rocked like the San Francisco quake. And suddenly she stood without the circle, a huge figure in chain mail and medieval armor. Meddler and slave, she said. How dare you summon me for your petty desires? Learn this lesson once, if not for all. Turn your face from me in shame. And as you turned, she reached out with her mailed glove and struck you on the top and back of your head. You dropped like a stone. Across the magic circles? They weren't designed for major devils. You swore no presence could cross them. Nothing but her arm and her fist. But it's five feet from that outer circle to the center of the triangle where I was standing. I told you the circle was for lesser demons. What happened after she struck me? The spirit disappeared. The room was clogged with smoke. I opened the door to let it out and came back to you. You had fallen almost into the fireplace. I pulled the rug back, arranged the furniture as best I could, and fled. I thought you were dead. Oh, <laughs> I'm alive. Yes, yes, but it's not possible. When I left you just before sunrise, you were dead. What witchcraft can do, it can undo. Whoever and whatever I am, I'm alive. Make no mistake about that. Goodbye, Anton. I don't need you anymore. Oh, hi, Trudy. I thought you'd gone with Rod and Dad. Oh, hello, Mike. I thought you were over in the studio. <laughs> we ran out of beer. Ah, you're out of luck. <laughs> Rod's bringing some home. Well, I found something more refreshing. What? You. Uh, 
<laughs> oh, if you'd waited just a little longer, you'd have found me anyway. I was going to wander over to the studio and visit you. Oh, so that's why you stayed home. <laughs> oh, don't be silly. Someone had to wash the dishes. <laughs> as long as I'm house guest, I thought I ought to do something for my keep. Well, you're staying here tonight? One whole week. Mom went up with Pops to his 35th class reunion. And they figured that with one full-fledged minister and a recent hospital dropout... I was suitably chaperoned. <laughs> Safe as a church, huh? <laughs> uh, Rod and Dad say uh, when they'd be back? Uh, not till pretty late, I guess. Mm. Pretty rough section of town. That's why Rod insisted on going along. Mm, what's the occasion? That's one of your father's oldest parishioners. I guess the old lady is dying. She asked for the minister. Well, her loss, my gain. What? Oh, nothing. It's just a stupid joke. Uh, you said you wanted to see the studio? Oh, yes. Would you mind? Mind? Uh, look, I I'm out of beer, but uh, I've got some champagne that's begging to be what it is. Oh, what is it? A split. Just right for sharing. Shall we go? Well, won't you walk into my parlor, said Beelzebub to the flies. <laughs> I don't know what that's supposed to mean. <laughs> that is the advantage of a classical education. Uh -huh. Beelzebub, god of the Philistine city of Ekron. You know, he was known as the lord of the flies. Why? Well, now, there you've got me. Well, he, he sounds horrid. <laughs> well, he wasn't very popular with Christians. In fact, they called him the Prince of Devils. Lord of the Flies. Mm -hmm. Oh, that gives me the creeps. <laughs> Here's something to chase your creeps away. Oh, I, I don't want that, Mike. It goes right to my head. Oh, just a sip. Hmm? A good luck toast to sister and brother-in-law Hood. Our getting to know you party. Well, far be it from me to be a party pooper. Oh, there's nothing more cozy and reassuring than a room full of books. What's this section here? Oh, that? That's the main reason I needed Dad's particular library since my exam was in metaphysics. The black arts, the world of witches, essentials of demonology, the satanic mass. Oh, it's a strange collection for a minister. And it's always good to know your enemy. Now, Dad's quite an authority on the devil and his work. And you? Are you thinking of becoming a minister, Mike? <laughs> Min me? <laughs> no, 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 no. Perish the thought. No, nope, my philosophy is too easy for that. I long ago decided that if you can't fight him, join him. I mean, can't you see how evil I am? Attempting you with spiritous beverages, coaxing you here to my lair, and now, having anesthetized my prey, making ready... To spring? I don't think you're being very funny, Mike. Oh, is this where you hit your head? Hmm? Oh, yes, yes, so they say. No, I wasn't being altogether funny. What do you mean? Truly, have you any idea how jealous I am of my older brother? Abroad? Why? A month ago, or whenever it was, they turned up with you. My first thought was... Why couldn't I find something like that? Oh, that's very flattering, Mike. But you're a little young for the big step. Not so young as you think. Perhaps. I don't care what you and Rod have been to each other. It was me you wanted. Still want. Only you're afraid of breaking your word. If this is a joke. It's no joke. Mike, let... Go of me. You wanted me from the moment you laid eyes on me, just as I have you. Oh, you've been reading too many naughty books. Don't laugh. There's nothing funny about this. No, not really. Offensive. You're afraid of me. Don't be silly. Afraid of yourself. Now that really is the last straw. Test it. Straw. Test it. Fasten your mouth to mine. Wind yourself about me. Try forbidden love and it will never let you go. Oh, my let me go. You're hurting me. Oh, that's Rod home with your father. If you won't let me go, I'll scream. What are you going to tell them? Nothing. Nothing. I wouldn't want them to know what a pig you are. I think that blow on the head must have done more damage than you think. Mike, you'd better see a psychiatrist. Oh, hi, Rod. Dad. Uh, well, we didn't expect you. Esther, my Lucifer, I'll have you yet. 
cowering at my feet like a slave to use you once and destroy you as I shall use your surrogate tonight. For whether she may be... Oh, dear, oh, dear. How best you. What, Reverend Damon? Just something that happened to a girl on the other side of town. Let me see. Rachel. <gasps> Awful. Well, now you got me going. <laughs> you too, Jean? Well, since you can't read, I'll read it to you. The body of Elizabeth Migler, 21, was discovered in Marsden Park today by a passerby. Although it was later determined the girl had been raped, the strange features of the case are that she was not robbed, and as though by some ferocious animal tooth marks, showed that her throat had been literally ripped to pieces... Good Lord. Where, where is Marsden Park? It's clear over the other side of town. When did it happen? Uh, night before last. Morning, all. I hope breakfast is all ready. I'm famished. <coughs> What's wrong with that cat? Oh, it's beginning to bug me. A lot of things are beginning to bug me. What did you say, honey? Uh, nothing, Rod. I, I, I don't think I'll have any breakfast this morning. I, I don't feel like eating. No, Rod, please, don't come with me. I'd rather be alone. Lovers quarrel? Look, will you just fake out, brother mine? It's none of your business. For Trudy's sake, for everyone's sake, would that it were. But, unfortunately, we know better. Or do we? The crime happened miles away. And the devil that may possess Mike is there only on the evidence of a tipsy charwoman who summons the devil, never calls for him in vain, and once met, few are lucky to get rid of him again. I'll return shortly with Act Three. And now back to the CBS Mystery Theater. In the kitchen of the Damon house, Rod glares angrily at his brother, who shrugs it off and goes to the refrigerator for orange juice. A troubled Reverend Damon eyes both his sons as he closes and folds the tabloid in his hands as if it were just as unclean as it is. Rod, unchallenged by Mike, breaks the silence first. I'd better go on upstairs and check on Trudy. Well, she said she wanted to be alone. Look, will you stay out of this? Well, I'm not even in it. Well, just an objective comment. So keep it to yourself. Now, come on, Rod. I didn't mean to butt in... Catch me up. What's all the hostility about? No hostility. Just a reaction to a peculiarly unpleasant crime. I think I'll go up and apologize to Trudy for spoiling everyone's breakfast. That's a good idea, Dad. And if I can leave you two alone. Well, I have no quarrel with anyone. Now, forget it, Dad. I just got upset over Trudy. I, I shouldn't have jumped on Mike. Well, then, let me see if I can make a future in-law... A little happier in our house. What happened, Rod? Oh, it all started over this tabloid story about some poor kid who got raped and mangled in Marsden Park. Oh? Here, read all about it. <whistles> kind of gruesome, all right. But there's one of these every day. Yeah, but not in such gory detail. It really got to truly... You know, I've never seen her upset like that. I mean, so... So subjectively involved. Oh? What do you suppose triggered that? Oh, I don't know. I just sure wish I did. Or maybe it's better to let sleeping dogs lie. Who is it? Your future father-in-law. May I come in for a minute? Just a sec. The door's locked. Come on in, Reverend Damon. Feeling any better? Oh, not really. Oh, I should be ashamed of myself reading that yellow sheet. I, I like to think it helps keep my sense of balance, but uh, maybe I'm just a seeker of vicarious excitement. Like that rather complete collection on Satanism and the occult that you have in your studio? Ah, you noticed that, did you? Night before last. 
when I was over there with Mike while you and Rod had gone to see your old parishioner who was dying. Did she? As a matter of fact, no. She made a remarkable recovery. Oh, really? Well, you looked so sort of worried when you came home. I, I thought you... I was worried about you, Trudy. And Mike. Why? You, because I knew you were upset about something. Well, you can't be a minister for over 40 years without learning to read something about people. And Mike? Mike is an enigma to me since I brought him back from the hospital. A rather terrifying thought to realize I've lost contact with my own son. I'd like to ask your help, Trudy, and I'll lay it right on the line. Why were you at the studio with him? And what happened there? You, you won't tell Rod? Not if you don't want me to. Then what I'd like more than anything is to tell someone, most of all you, for Mike's sake. Because I think he needs help. And you're the only one who could bring it to him. Or make him go find it. <laughs> Reverend Damon, this is a pleasure. I'm on my way to a class. Can we talk as we cross campus? Yes. Just, uh, what is the name of your course that Mike is taking? Philosophy. Or perhaps more specifically, metaphysics. Rather freewheeling. I mean, it's, it's advanced and we spend more time on the perimeters than we do on the core subjects. Hmm. Just what were you and Mike up to that long night before his injury? I was coaching him for an examination. An examination in what? On what subject? By the class I teach, general philosophy. And you left before Michael was hurt? Oh, good Lord, yes. Would I have left the boy if he were injured? Would you have fled the scene unless you were up to something dark and vile enough to stain your reputation? I am sorry your boy was hurt. I had no part in it. And I resent your holier-than-thou accusations. If you'll excuse me, I have a class waiting for me. And now for the rug. There. Does it? Oh, my dear Lord. Just what I was afraid of. What are you afraid of, Dad? You, Mike. That you'd turned away from God to seek the devil. Why, Mike? Why? Who knows? Now, what shall I tell you? Hmm? That life's a drag. It has no purpose, no goals, no triumphs that aren't tarnished. That there's no good in man. Nothing but pettiness and meanness and me first and the devil take the hindmost. That's not what I brought you up to believe. No one blames you, Dad. But Trudy was the last straw. That Rod could find the woman he wanted and she could turn out to be the one that I need. So I chose his worship. And here we built my altar. Don't desecrate that name. The altar belongs to God. This altar belongs to Satan. See the circle traced in vermilion paint? Exactly nine feet wide, an eight-foot charcoal one within. Light the votive candles, burn the incense, let the mass begin. Mike, what are you doing? I won't tolerate this, this sacrilege. You can no more move than the woman I desire can resist my power. I am the way. I am the darkness. I am the truth. I am the darkness. I am the truth. Lord of the universe whom the winds fear. I am he whose mouth ever flameth. You answer me. The I in hope. The boneless one that did create the darkness and the light. The I command to serve me and send me the woman I desire. Truly... Don't come in here. But the rain. What's going on here? Rod, it's your brother. He's gone mad. Spawn of the outer world. Stay back. Stay back. Or I will smite thee dead where thou standest. Leave. Or leave except the woman who is mine. What's going on? Look out. He's going for trouble.
Trudy. Now look, Nick. Oh, he has a knife. Would you murder your own brother? Okay, Nick, I'm not fooling around. Don't you know I could always take you? Oh, Rod, I hope you haven't hurt him too much. Oh, don't worry, baby. He always had a glass jaw. He had something more perishable than that. Call the hospital. And better tell them to bring a straitjacket. The top of the night to you, Mrs. Gideon. And what's that wee bottle in the paper bag? A little poteen? Nothing of the sort, Dr. Smart Attic. <laughs> That's a noggin of holy water blessed by me own Monsignor, which I carry with me when I come near this place ever since three days ago. What happened to old P.J.? Did anyone ever turn up to claim him? No. Oh, by the way, while we're on the gossip column, uh, guess who's back in the hospital? Oh, not the other one. Mm-hmm, the same. Lying in the emergency room under a deep sedation in a straitjacket. Oh, what did they bring him back here for? That's what Dr. Considine and his father, the Reverend Damon, are discussing now in the prep room. Well, if you're going to swap out the emergency, you'd better get at it fast. Well, I'll tell you something, Doctor. Mm -hmm. If I'm to be there and alone with that devil, you'll never see emergency this clean again. For I'm adding the Monsignor's holy water to me pail right now, just in case. Of course, we'll run every neurological test in the book on him under the circumstances, Reverend Damon. I'm not sure it will do any good... I'm afraid the trouble is psychiatric. Well, it has to be one or the other unless we're to accept Mrs. Gideon's diagnosis of possession. Mrs. Gideon? Oh, I remember now. She was one of the people, like the intern, who remembered that they thought they saw a considerable skull compression. Which never existed, believe me. Just a, an illusion like Mrs. Gideon's. What was Mrs. Gideon's illusion? Well, I'm afraid she'd uh, had a drink or two and she had some wild story about a black devil streaming out of an old dipsomaniac who was also in the emergency room and, and being sucked up through your son's nostrils. <laughs> I'm really even embarrassed to mention such nonsense. Come in. Excuse me, Dr. Considine, but the patient is coming too. Mr. Damon? Yes, sir. He's still in the straitjacket. I, uh, I think, Reverend, if you don't mind until we see what state he's in. I don't mind. You might as well both know that the police are by now well aware that my, my son was responsible for the violent death of a young woman the night before last while under the possession of whatever devils or devil owns him. Shall we go? My Nergal and Thomas and Belfagor, no one can have me in. I am the lion, Lord of the Flies, and your bonds cannot hold me. Good Lord, he's out of the straitjacket. Uh, I'll get help. What's going on here, Mrs. Gideon? Oh, Lord, preserve us. It's the devil incarnate. Oh, stay away from the doctor. He'll run you to a crisp with his fire. Oh, you oh, stay away from him. Leave him to me. Michael, my son. Call me not by that filthy angel's name. Stay away, you man. For I carry death in my hand as a sword. Michael. I warned you. Oh, you admit it's a man of the cloth. Get back. Get back. What happened? Oh, sure it was the Monsignor's holy water. Just as strong as life. Michael, no. All right, boys. All hey. right, Daniels, you're too late. What? Excuse me, Reverend. Let me see. Daniels, come here. Hey, yes, sir. Was that the depression you were talking about when this man was first brought in? Yes, sir. That's what I thought I saw. Well, at least it's what we all see now. But how? I haven't any answers. I only know... <laughs> I'm... Sorry, Reverend Damon, but your son is... is dead. He hasn't been my son since his first visit here. The mercy of God is that whatever possessed him died with him. 
Thanks to this lady here. Oh, if I hadn't had the holy water. Oh, the Lord does move in mysterious ways. Don't he, Reverend Sir? In mysterious ways and kind ones. What a field day the Reverend Damon's tabloids might have had if Michael had ever come to trial for the death of that poor innocent girl. Innocent. Perhaps that's the theme of this dark history. If Michael had been less innocent, and it had the guts to be less self-interested and bored, how different his world might have been. But that's the answer, isn't it? We all make our own world. We can't rely on anyone else to make it for us. I'll be back shortly. I suppose I should resist the impulse, but I have to admit I can't. It's one of the rewards for being host, particularly with guests who can't answer back, at least directly. So just for once, a homily. Reach out and find life. Take it and make the most of it. For if nothing else, our story proves to the hilt the oldest of adages. If you don't, the devil finds work for idle hands to do. Our cast included Donald Buca. Joan Shea, Ian Martin, Guy Sorrell, and Leon Janney. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Now, a preview of our next tale. No trouble, though. He went numb pretty fast. I thought he would. He wanted me to give you a message, but then he couldn't remember what it was. Oh, uh, and he thinks you're some kind of a warden. Poor man. You know, Mr. Z, I didn't much like it inside that room. You knew you were coming out. Who ever dreamed up the black room anyway? I have no idea. Somebody must have. There's always been a black room, far as I know. Hell of a place. Yes. How long will he last, do you think? Matter of days. Weeks, possibly. Then what? He'll go mad. Or die. Wonder what he's doing now. Oh... Counting by twos, then by threes, then by fours. Anything to keep from thinking. That's what they all do. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams... About a year ago, I began getting tons of notifications about how somebody was trying to log into my social media. I was getting email phishing scams on a daily basis. I was being inundated with email sales pitches from companies I'd never even heard of. I was getting calls and texts from those same companies. I was listening to a podcast that talked about Incogni, short for incognito, and I thought I'd give it a try. For the past year, Incogni has reduced the number of email and spam calls and texts that I receive, it's helped to protect my identity from hackers, and helps keep my data safe. Over the past year, Incogni has successfully removed my personal information from over 200 different data brokerage sites, and I get regular updates on how many are still in progress, how many have been successfully completed, and how many requests were sent out to remove my personal information. It would have taken me over 160 hours to do all of this, and nobody has time or patience for that. Fortunately, it's all taken care of by Incogni. 
I live online personally and professionally, and I trust Incogni to help me live with a lot less worry. You can give Incogni a try right now by visiting WeirdDarkness.com slash Incogni. That's short for incognito. I-N-C-O-G-N-I. WeirdDarkness.com slash Incogni. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. In ancient folklore of the Seminole Indians of Oklahoma in the United States, there was a vampire-like creature called a stakini, or man-owl. Likewise, terrifying stakini legends are widespread among the Creek people. Originally, the stakini were believed to be malevolent witches who transformed themselves into undead, huge, owl-like monsters. Technically dead, but constantly reanimated they could spend their nights seeking human hearts to consume. Hearing the terrifying cry of a stakini is an omen of impending death. Many Native Americans who know the stakini stories avoid mentioning this bizarre creature openly. Usually, only certain medicine people tell about the stakini without putting someone at risk for turning into one. By day, stakini appear as an ordinary human, but at night, the stakini make terrible things. It vomits up all its internal organs and hangs them in a tree or hides them somewhere else to prevent animals from eating them. Then it can change its appearance into a great horned owl. In this disguise, it flies out in search of a sleeping person to prey upon. It removes the still-beating heart from its victim by pulling it out of his mouth and then it takes the heart back to its home. It cooks the heart in an enchanted pot and eats it in secret. The stakini needs to consume one human heart each night, while, for example, Jiangji, a Chinese hopping vampire, kills living creatures to absorb their qi life force, according to Chinese legends. Before dawn, the stakini returns to its hidden organs and swallows them, and then it looks again as an ordinary human being. Ancient people believed that there may be a way to get rid of the creature, but it is very difficult. At first, a person has to find its organs hidden by the stakini while the creature is still hunting, and then destroy it before dawn, which guarantees the death of the monster. Sunlight is also disastrous for the creature stakini who has not turned back into human shape. This can be done with some specially chosen arrows, which are decorated with owl feathers, then ritually blessed and dressed with sacred herbs. When the stakini returns to consume its organs, one can fire upon it with the magic arrow, as this is the only time that the creature is vulnerable. Stakini is a dangerous shapeshifter with the ability to transform into any animal at once, but it prefers to perform as an owl. By day, it takes on the form of a human in disguise. It undergoes a physical or perhaps even mental transformation. It lives its daily life as a human, socializing with the community and mimicking the human's behavior perfectly without ever being exposed. The creature's true origin is camouflaged and there is no way to reveal it. The Stakini folklore is rather widespread and popular among natives of America. Though the shape-shifting evil creature originates in Seminole lands, over the years, Many legends and stories about Stakini have circulated in swampy regions of New Jersey and Michigan. The Iroquois have an interesting legend about a horrifying flying head that terrorized people for no apparent reason. This was no ordinary head of a normal person. The head was huge, 
about four times larger than the size of a man. This bodiless creature had great wings protruding from its cheeks. Lurking in the forest, the monster was coated in thick, black hair, and its mouth was filled with fangs. It ate everything that was alive, including humans. What is interesting and slightly unusual about this Native American monster is that it seems to have vanished into thin air. The flying head was seen by many, but then it simply disappeared, and no one knows what happened to it. The story of the flying head of the Iroquois is different than most other flying creatures of Native American lore because there are very few sightings of this dangerous creature. Legends tell one day a man spotted the flying head soaring through treetops. It seemed to be nothing more than a shadow, but it was glowing brightly. He hurried back to the village and told everyone to leave as fast as they could, and everyone left, except for one woman who stayed there with her baby. The woman sat beside the hearth and built the fire up into a great blaze, then heated some stones to a red-hot glow. Suddenly the flying head appeared, its horrible mouth slavering as it looked into the longhouse from the far end. Not giving any sign that she noticed it, the young woman began to pretend she was eating a meal. She picked up the red-hot rocks with a forked stick and pretended to put them in her mouth, and with each bite she said how great it tasted, what wonderful meat it was. The monster watched, growing hungrier and hungrier, his horrid mouth drooling until he could wait no longer. He stuck his head far into the longhouse and swallowed the entire heap of burning rocks. A horrible scream pierced the night and another, and the monster frantically beat its wings and flew off into the dark, screaming in agony and rage. He screamed so loud the trees that he flew past all trembled. People scattered here and there in the forest and fell to the ground, covering their ears. The monster kept screaming as he flew further and further away from the longhouse until his screams could be heard no longer, and the people rose up from the ground and went home, finally safe. The origin of the flying head remains a mystery. Some think the head belongs to a murder victim. According to other Native American beliefs, a human is transformed into a flying head after committing an act of cannibalism. According to both Iroquois and Wyandotte mythology, flying heads are ravenous spirits that are cursed with an insatiable hunger. Sometimes flying heads are also associated with whirlwinds. As previously mentioned, the flying head that terrorized the Iroquois came and vanished without a trace. What happened is unknown. Some think it died, though that is unlikely if it was a true spirit. Another option is that it is still alive, and some of the Iroquois think that it went to the sea. Perhaps it is now hunting creatures that reside underwater. Up next on Weird Darkness, we'll learn about shape-shifting thunderbirds. Anywhere and anything can be haunted, and many people from all walks of life experience strange things in surprising locations. As you will discover, the prettiest of places, the most innocent of places, and the most unexpected places can still be filled with supernatural forces and pure demonic malevolence. Haunted places, churches, hospitals, forests, the workplace, and more. Horrifying true tales of ghosts, demons, poltergeists, and the paranormal. Come and be chilled by people's creepy experiences with the supernatural in ordinary, everyday places. Warning, listening to this audiobook may increase nervousness. True Tales of Haunted Places by G. Michael Vasey. Narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar. You're a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. Mm. 
The Weird Circle. In this cave by the restless sea, we are met to call from out the past stories strange and weird. Bellkeeper, toll the bell so all may know we are gathered again in the Weird Circle. Closes the horror in man's mind. This is a tale of the house and the brain. Come with me to London, through the heavy fog of the city, to a large house of the suburbs. A young couple enter the portals of that house to attend an art auction. Well, hello, Jim. We've been looking all over for you. We've got quite a crowd here today. Paul Whitney, Sandra, I'm glad you've come. I thought you two were refugees from this sort of thing. Well, frankly, Jim, I've suddenly conceived a passion for good oil paintings, and I'm going to buy this fabulous painting of the ancient cutthroat. Well, to tell you the truth, Jim, she suddenly conceived a passion for cutthroats, ancient or otherwise. Oh, <laughs> my husband abuses me. I'm too nice to her, or she'd never be interested in any other man. But, <laughs> The man in the portrait's been dead 400 years. Dead or living, he's not beyond your charms. Oh, but my husband loves me, Jim. Must be my fatal fascination. Yes. <laughs> but I didn't come here to talk with you, even if it is fun. I came here to see that oil painting. Oh, it's quite a painting. Yes, so we've heard. It's in my study. Come and take a look before the auction starts. Hmm? Now, don't fall in love with it, Sandy. No matter how you feel about 15th century reprobates, I'm not going to spend a fortune buying useless pictures. <laughs> well... There's the picture. What do you think? He has a face you'll never forget. And a reputation. Yes, sir, he lived a full life. You know, he was supposed to have been fabulously wealthy. But when he died, his fortune disappeared. Oh, my dumpling aunt. He looks like the kind of man who sticks pins in people for the devil of it. Sandra. The strangest thing about the picture is the man's eyes. You get the feeling that the eyes are alive. Yes, very definitely. Clever work. Paul. What's the matter with you, Sandra? I could have sworn I've... I've seen that man in London recently. What man? The one in the picture. What? <laughs> He's been dead 400 years. Stop snickering at me, Jim. I know what I've seen. Impossible. The only thing left of the Honorable Cutthroat Richards is the house on Orchard Street. He built it 450 years ago, and it's never been really habitable since. Why? Well, this is your chance to laugh at me. It's haunted. Haunted? Oh, not really. Really? Oh, Jim, Jim, I've never met a ghost. And you never will, Sandra. Jim, oh, Jim, please, please, oh, please, imagine a really, truly ghost. <laughs> Wonderful, Jim, take us over. Or, better yet, I'll rent the place for a week. I've heard a lot about ghosts, but I've never been able to pin one down. You know, I've been a student of the occult for a long time. Jim, 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 please. Oh, Sandra, I'm serious. It's dangerous business, this ghost hunting. Uh, please, fella, anything to get Sandra's mind off buying that picture. Very well, but you'll find some very real ghosts over there. The housekeeper, Mrs. Browning, will rent you a room if you want one. But she's the only person who's ever been able to stay in the old house. <laughs> Thanks, old man. Come along, Sandra. But the picture. Hang the picture, my sweet. I've got a genuine ghost for you. open all by itself. There's no one there. Doors aren't supposed to open by themselves, Paul. Well, what do you expect? The house is haunted, isn't it? Hmm. Door slammed by itself, too. Woo, tricky place, isn't it? You frightened? Not in the least. And it isn't my knees that are shaking, pet. It's yours. Wonder where the housekeeper is. Her name's Mrs. Browning. Call her and see what happens. All right. Mrs. Browning! <gasps> Don't poke me, Paul. I didn't poke you. Well, I didn't poke myself. Oh, hey. 
I wonder if we're alone. Look behind me, Paul. If it's a ghost, I don't want to meet it quite yet. Silly, it's broad daylight. Anybody knows ghosts never appear until nightfall. Paul, Paul, look. It's the child's footprint right there in front of me, a wet footprint. Great heavens. No, another one. Just like the footprint of a child who's taken a bath. Oh, my chubby aunt. Listen. The footprints lead upstairs. Shall we follow? Well, it's the obvious thing to do. Ghastly cold in here, Sandy, isn't it? Ghostly cold at any rate. Uh-huh. You're not quite up to form, old girl. You sure you want to go through with this? No, I'm positive. Oh, almost anyway. Sandy, the footprints, they disappear. <laughs> maybe, it's, maybe it's all done with mirrors. Good afternoon. Do come in the sitting room. Oh, you must be Mrs. Browning. I'm Sandra Whitney, and this is my husband. How do you do? How do you do? Mr. Danvers told me you were coming. Won't you be seated? Thank you, Mrs. Browning. I hope my stepdaughter didn't frighten you. Your stepdaughter? Well, I didn't see anyone. Naturally. She's dead. You mean the footprints we saw? Yes, of course. Uh, you didn't see or hear anything else? No. Expecting anyone? Yes. They're coming for me shortly. My time is up, and I must die in the way they've planned it. They? Those who live in this house, Mrs. Whitney. Oh, come, Mrs. Browning, you don't really believe ghosts actually live here. Believe it? I know it. You see, Mr. Whitney, when I was first married 40 years ago, my husband, my stepdaughter, and myself moved into this house. They were here then. Why didn't you move out? Oh, we became used to them. Then my stepdaughter died. My husband had an unfortunate accident, and I was left alone. You've lived here alone ever since? Yes. Waiting for them to take me. Mrs. Browning, how much will you charge my wife and myself for an apartment here by the week? Charge? Nothing. Nothing at all. Anybody who has the courage to stay here is most welcome. But I advise you against it. Listen. What is it? Souls crying for release. Release from him. Oh, come, Mrs. Browning. You don't believe me? <laughs> you will when you move in. When can I expect you? Tonight at eight. How about it, Paul? That sounds jolly. You'll use the east wing. I'll have a fire lit for you. But let me warn you once again. They'll be waiting for you. Day and night. <laughs> Sandra, all back? Of course, Paul. Down, Blackie. Down, I say. Oh, if you keep squirming, I'll never get you on a leash. I'd better take some pistols along with us. Well, I'm not at all sure you can shoot a ghost, Paul. I'm not at all sure it is a ghost. Something awfully phony about all that. Oh, no. My intuition says there were ghosts in that house, darling, and I've a very perceptive intuition. Sandra, so, uh, you're not going to take Blackie with you. Well, of course I am. He's a watchdog, isn't he? But a uh, dog. Now, darling, remember how nicely he caught pheasant last year. But pheasant aren't the same thing as ghosts at all. Stuff and nonsense. You ready? All ready. And here's your coat, dear. Oh, look out the window, Paul. So peaceful out there. You've always been partial to twilight. Oh, reminds me of the time you courted me. <laughs> it was such a nice time. Paul, that man, the one on the street. What man? The one standing right out there. Look at him. That's the same man whose portrait we saw at Jim Danvers' house today. Sandra, Sandra, where are you going? To talk to him, Pat, of course. <laughs> My chubby aunt. It is him. Oh, excuse me, sir. I couldn't help noticing you and... You noticed me? You are Mr. Richards, aren't you? I've been known to many by many names. Oh, dear, please pardon me if I'm rude, but... Well, how in the devil did you manage to stay alive for 400 years? You will notice my eyes. Look deep. Deep. Oh, let me go. 
Let me go. Deeply into my eyes. You've never seen me before. You don't know me. You can never remember me again. Keep walking, Sandra. I hope you're properly ashamed of yourself, approaching strange men and asking them silly questions. Well, I'm sorry, Paul. It was stupid of me, but anybody can be wrong. Of course they can, but on the face of it, it was silly. Expecting a man who was alive 400 years ago to be roaming around loose. It wasn't a matter of looseness, Pet. It was a matter of liveness. Now, now come on, stop being a husband and hold my arm. I ought to tear it off and beat you over the head with it. Mm, he's so virile. But I love him. <laughs> well, come along, Sandy. There's your haunted house ahead. We don't want to keep Mrs. Browning waiting. Or the ghost. <laughs> that door again. Insidious feeling, doors opening and slamming. Mrs. Browning! Mrs. Browning! I'm in the east wing, Mr. Whitney, just lighting the fire. You better go on up. This hall's drafty. Hey, Paul, it's more than cold in here. It's almost as if something or somebody is draining your body of all warmth. That's a pleasant thought, Sandy. Now that you've scared yourself stiff, move. Well, I was just getting in the mood for golf. Where's the east wing? This way, Mrs. Whitney. Oh, hello, Mrs. Browning. Well, this room looks cheerful. It's as gay as my mood. Nice fire, nice candles. <laughs> quiet, quiet, Black. <laughs> Don't scare somebody. <laughs> a dog scare somebody? Not tonight. They came tonight. What came tonight? You see. Better make yourselves at home while you can. Blackie, sit down. Over here, Blackie. Look at him, Paul. The hairs on his head are standing on end. Be quiet, Blackie. Blackie! Look! I told you they were here. A luminous mass. A blue mass. Sandy, be careful. It's materializing. Coming for me. I knew it. Coming for me. Oh, Mrs. Browning, Paul. Fingers are choking her. Good heavens. Mrs. Browning. Oh, Paul, stop this horrible Coming thing. Coming for me. Get me. Get me. It's horrible. It's all right, Sandra. All right, darling. Oh, it's, it's gone, hasn't it? Yes. It's gone. But Mrs. Browning, she's dead. the scene of the crime. Nobody tells Detective Hodges that a flesh-and-blood woman gets bumped off by a ghost. But I saw it myself. Oh, be quiet, Blackie. If you'd only relax, Detective Hodges, and go away, we'd catch the ghost for you. Quiet! I'm only trying to help, but I... Blackie, stop! Sandra, you're only confusing the issue. Paul's right, Sandra. Sit down over here. Jim Danvers, if you side with Paul, I'll never speak to you. Now, Mr. Whitney, if you don't mind, we'll go over the details again. What happened? Well, Mrs. Whitney and I were here in this room with Mrs. Browning when a blue mass suddenly floated in the door. The lights in the fireplace dimmed, the candles were extinguished, and Mrs. Browning began to scream. Why? Because she saw a ghost. It's really all so simple. Sandra, my dear. And then what happened? The mass suddenly materialized, at least sufficiently, for us to see two hands. Two hands without a body. The hands reached out, grasped Mrs. Browning by the throat, and... That was that. Thank you, Mrs. Whitney. 
I suppose you expect me to believe that story? There's no reason for you to doubt Mr. Whitney's word, Detective Hodge. I'm not saying there is. But there was only three people in this room, and one of them is dead. Everybody's under arrest. Everybody, do you hear? Oh, Paul, it's here again. Look, Detective Hodge. Uh, Paul, Sandra. Oh, Paul, for heaven's sake. Uh, uh, what is it? An axe murderer in ectoplasm. Sandra, don't be funny. Let's get out of this house before it gets all of us. It's gone. Yes, it's gone. Now do you believe us, Detective Hodge? Yes. Yes, I, I believe you. I'll have Mrs. Browning's body removed to the morgue right away. Paul, if you insist on staying in this house overnight, I'll not be responsible for what happened. But, Jim, I'm convinced that there are no such things as ghosts. Now, now please, Jim, take Sandra back home and leave me. I'm not budging without you, uh, Pat. Sandra, don't be foolish. Well, no matter what you two do, I'm not staying here. Oh, go, old fuzzy beard. Take thy tired body and deliver it to a safe, warm bed. Poor Jim. Scared of a little ghost. <laughs> it's 11 p.m. already. Well, good night, Paul, Sandra. Nighty-night, Jim. What was that? You mean the footfalls? Yes, what is it? The housekeeper's dead stepdaughter. You see, it's all so simple. Good grief. Good night. <laughs> oh, we've been all through the house, Paul, and I'm dead tired. Come on, let's go to bed. You go to bed. I'll sit up and read these letters we found in the attic. <laughs> Blackie, come here, come here. Now lie down next to me. There, poor Blackie, poor doggy. You don't like the ghosties, do you, Pat? Poor, poor Blackie. Hey, this letter's interesting. What is it? Evidently a letter from the housekeeper to her husband. A love letter. She talks about her brother's child. It seems her brother left his money to his daughter and she handled the estate for the child. Hmm, that's jolly. Maybe that's the child she calls her stepdaughter. Hmm. Uh, let's see what it says. Listen. Since we have managed the child's end, you and I are more than lovers. We are partners in many things. Sounds as if they murdered the child. Yes, it does. Sandra, I wonder if my theory's right. If people felt strong passions, and if those passions linger in a house after the people have gone, couldn't that create a heavy psychic atmosphere? Well, those fingers that murdered Mrs. Browning were more than heavily psychic. Unhook the collar of my dress, Paul. Where will I put the letters down on the dressing table here? Just a top hook. Oh, better keep these pistols handy just in case. Something about a gun that gives me courage. Funny. Oh, it's midnight. I'm tired and nothing's funny. You know Mrs. Browning's sitting room? It seems to be an extra addition to this house. It, it juts out from the rest of the building like a sleeping porch. What's funny about that? Well, that horrible cold and the footfalls all seem to emanate from that room. Oh, you and your logical mind. Oh. What's the matter, Sandy? Oh, look. The fire's dimming. Oh. Just, oh. Just like a great black shadow standing in front of it. Give me my gun. Here, dear. Shh, Blackie, shh. Look, Sandy. A hand reaching out from the wall. The letters. It's got the letters. Oh, great, Scott. Oh, my chubby aunt. Watch it. It's the hand of... Of the housekeeper. How do you know? It's got the same ring on she had on this afternoon. If that's not a ghost, I've never seen one. The fire's going out, Sandra. Ah! Sandra! It's all around us! Sandra! Sandra! Your will against mine. My will is greater. No. Succumb, succumb. My will is greater. No, you're a shadow. And you are a mere mortal who knows no secrets beyond the veil. I control the world of shadows. Succumb, fool, succumb. No, no, go away. You're nothing but an image. You will die by my command in this house. You will die before morning. Admit my will. No, no, I will not admit your will. Sandra, you're safe now on your own home. Just lie still, darling, and drink this. Oh, Paul. I was a fool to allow you to stay in that accursed place last night. 
I ought to have my head examined. I came over as soon as I got your message, Paul. Oh, come on in, Jim. Sound is recovering from a bit of a shock. Yes, I heard about it. I warned you, Paul, that house is definitely haunted. I'm going to board it up. It's completely useless. No, that's not the answer, Jim. It isn't ghosts. At least, not in the real sense of the word. Why, Paul, after what you went through, you say that? It's too malignant for a ghost. Do you believe in the power of hypnotism? Well, I've heard some amazing theories about it anyway. Well, I believe some power controls that house. Well, that's still ghosts. No, because the brain that controls the house is still alive. I'm convinced of it. Well, where do you think this man who controls the house is? He might be thousands of miles away. Remember you said that the eyes in the picture of the fabulous Richards seems alive? Oh, that's ridiculous. Not at all. In some crazy, mad manner, Richards has kept himself alive all these 400 years. In some hypnotic way, he controls that house. Well, if your theory is right, how can we break his control? Well, I'm certain that his control emanates from the little sitting room, which once belonged to Mrs. Browning. Yes. Now, if you'll let me, I'd like to hire workmen and tear that room off the rest of the house. Oh, but Paul, well, that's... The room is only an extra addition, Jim. It can't do any harm to try. Okay, pull up more of that flooring. Did you hurt yourself climbing that petition, Sandra? No. Oh, imagine a secret room down here, Paul, right beneath the sitting room. You see, Jim, Paul was right. That's like finding a box with a false bottom. That's all for now, boys. Uh, careful in your head, Sandra. This room isn't very big. But it's as cold as cold storage. Well, now you know how a hunk of beef feels in an ice box. That's gay. <laughs> a musty old room. Bed and four walls. And two drawers built into the wall over there. All modern conveniences. Uh, try to open them. They look rusty. Just pull. All right. Uh, there. The drawer's open. Oh, nothing but a lot of musty old clothes. Listen, Paul. Nothing unusual, Jim. Just the same footfalls we've been hearing all along. I'm beginning to become quite fond of them. Look, here. Why, it's a miniature painting. Yes, a painting of Mr. Richards. Look at it. The same face as that painting in my house. Look at the eyes in the miniature. Paul, they're alive. Great heavens. They're moving. You better put that portrait down, Paul. Yes, they are alive. Living matter in a painting. Oh, Paul, it's getting colder in here all the time. I feel faint, faint, and as if something unearthly is moving around. Open the next drawer, Paul. Hurry, I don't like this growing cold at all. Uh, it won't budge. No, the blasted thing. Uh, oh, there it is. Why, Paul, there's a thin china saucer full of crystal liquid with a compass floating on it. That's a strange thing. Hmm. There's an inscription written in the drawer. What's it say? As this compass moves, so my will dominates everything within these four walls. Everything dead or alive. Accursed be the house and restless the dwellers therein. What's it mean? This is the brain, Sandra. Richards controls this instrument through hypnotism. He can control a piece of paper or a chair or even the souls of the dead. Then this house is haunted. Yes, haunted by a malicious, malignant will. It keeps a man's spirit roving restlessly after death. Paul, Paul, look, look in that corner. Mr. Richards, you, you are alive. Yes, alive, quite alive, because I will to live. Very clever deduction, Mr. Whitney. Deduction? Yes, I heard your keen analysis of my activities. You are a hypnotist, then. I have been powerful for 400 years. Your blind stumbling onto my secret will not stop me now. I can will anything. I will the specters of the past. To re-enter this room. In heaven's name, man, stop this. Oh, that black shadow. It's here with us, closing in. Yes, oh. closing in. All those who have died in this house are my slaves, as you will be my slaves in a very few brief seconds. You are not the brain controlling this house. You gave that power to this compass. You transferred your power to this moving needle. Am I right, Mr. Richards? Put that compass down. Oh, no, I'll destroy it, Mr. Richards. No. You're completely powerless to harm us. Watch out, Paul. This partition's going to crumble. Paul! Sandra! Gosh, Paul, it's good to be back in our own home. What happened to Mr. Richards when the petition collapsed, Jim? Well, the workmen searched the debris around the house for Mr. Richards' body, but no trace of him was found. I'm afraid that he escaped. Oh, no. You mean 
He's still alive and free, Jim? Yes, indeed. That's just what I mean. Well, he won't be for long, Sandra. People everywhere will be warned, and every corner of this earth will be looking for him. Even his will can't defy the world, Sandra. No one man can ever fight the world. From the time-worn pages of the past, we have recalled the house and the brain. Bellkeeper, toll the bell. Imagine waking up one morning and when you look at your friends or loved ones, you see their ears, noses and mouths stretched back with deep grooves on their foreheads, cheeks and chins. All the people you know have suddenly turned into hideous, demonic creatures, and it's not even remotely close to Halloween. That's what one Tennessee man is experiencing right now. I talk about him in this week's Mind of Marlar, which you can find at mindofmarlar.com. No matter the time of day or season, sometimes you need to find a way to rid yourself of those ghostly chills that bring raised hairs and goosebumps to your skin. Other times you're looking for those ghostly chills. Either way, it sounds like you need a mug of Weird Dark Roast Coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee has deep notes of cocoa, caramel, and a touch of sinister sweetness that'll send shivers down your taste buds. This is an exclusive coffee that I selected specifically for you, my weirdo family. Weird Dark Roast is not available in stores, coffee houses, mad scientist labs, or even the dark web, but you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee – fresh roasted to order so it's as fresh as it can be when it lands on your doorstep and knocks three times. Grab yours now at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee does not actually knock on your door because it doesn't have arms or hands, so if you hear knocks at the door and no one answers when you ask who it is, it's probably paranormal and you should just leave the door shut and locked. I'm Darren Marlar. Welcome back to Weird Darkness. You can stay up to date on everything Weird Darkness by signing up for the email newsletter. It's free at WeirdDarkness.com. We continue now with Native American lore, and we start with some shape-shifting Thunderbirds. Native Americans have wonderful legends of a powerful and magnificent Thunderbird that was sent by the gods to protect humans from evil. When this huge eagle-like bird soared the skies, one could hear its mighty wings beat with the sound of rolling thunder. Its eyes were burning like fire and caused lightning. The Thunderbird was no ordinary bird. It was the spirit of the storm and a supernatural creature that was just as much feared as admired. Often described as a shapeshifter, 
It lived in a cloud above the highest peak the tribe could see or in a cave in the mountains. Various tribes tell slightly different stories about the Thunderbird, but all Indians feared the bird and tried not to anger it. Winnebago Indians of the northern Midwest and Plains states believed that the Thunderbird possessed supernatural powers. The Thunderbird was a shapeshifter and could take the form of humans. Interestingly, the legendary falcon warrior or birdman is a common motif in Mississippi culture. It has been depicted with a beaked face on unearthed artifacts from Cahokia to Georgia. In some traditions, Birdman is interpreted as a version of Redhorn, another heroic figure whose twin sons fought off a race of giants. Experts believe that Birdman was a warrior king, but it's also possible that this was a legendary Thunderbird. According to Winnebago Indians, the Thunderbird was able to manipulate weather, affecting the winds and creating storms, lightning, thunder, and rain. There were not just one Thunderbird, but many of them were often seen in the skies. The Thunderbirds were enemies, with the water spirits and the giant birds used their lightning when crossing the waters to protect them from the water spirits. The Passamaquoddy Indians, who live in northeastern North America, primarily in Maine and New Brunswick, have legends that confirm the Thunderbirds were shapeshifters. According to the Passamaquoddy, the Thunderbirds were men who could transform themselves into flying creatures. Their legend tells that Thunderbird is an Indian and he or his lightning would never harm another Indian. But Wachowson, the great bird from the south, tried hard to rival Thunderbird. So, Passamaquoddy's feared Wachosan, whose wings Glooskap once had broken because he used too much power. In Native American mythology, Glooskap is a mythical hero who defeated evil sorcerers and demon followers. We'll look closer at this character later on in this episode. The Quillayute Indians of the Pacific Northwest remember how the Thunderbird was sent by the Great Spirit to help the Indians after a horrible disaster. The Indians had no food, and many had died after rain and hail had fallen for many days, destroying all plants. After the rain came snow, and the Indians called the Great Spirit for help, and it then sent the people the Thunderbird. The story of the Thunderbird's arrival is described in detail in the book Indian Legends of the Pacific Northwest, written by Ella E. Clark. The people waited. No one spoke. There was nothing but silence and darkness. Suddenly there came a great noise and flashes of lightning cut the darkness. A deep whirring sound like giant wings beating came from the place of the setting sun. All of the people turned to gaze toward the sky above the ocean as a huge bird-shaped creature flew toward them. The bird was larger than any they had ever seen. Its wings from tip to tip were twice as long as a war canoe. It had a huge, curving beak, and its eyes glowed like fire. The people saw that its great claws held a living, giant whale. In silence, they watched while the Thunderbird, for so the bird was named by everyone, carefully lowered the whale to the ground before them. Thunderbird then flew high in the sky and went back to the thunder and lightning from which it had come. Perhaps it flew back to its perch in the hunting grounds of the Great Spirit. Thunderbird and Whale saved the Quileute from dying. The people knew that the Great Spirit had heard their prayer. Even today, they never forget that visit from Thunderbird, never forget that it ended long days of hunger and death. For on the prairie, near their village are big, round stones that the grandfathers say are the hardened hailstones of that storm long ago. The Thunderbird is also described as a very large bird that makes fearsome noise. Thunderbird is a very large bird with feathers as long as a canoe paddle. When he flaps his wings, he makes thunder and the great winds. When he opens and shuts his eyes, he makes lightning. In stormy weather, he flies through the skies, flapping his wings and opening and closing his eyes. Thunderbird's home is a cave in the Olympic Mountains, and he wants no one to come near. 
If hunters get close enough so he can smell them, he makes thunder noise and he rolls ice out of his cave. The ice rolls down the mountainside, and when it reaches a rocky place, it breaks into many pieces. The pieces rattle as they roll further down into the valley. All the hunters are so afraid of Thunderbird and his noise and rolling ice that they never stay long near his home. No one ever sleeps near his cave either. Thunderbird keeps his food in a dark hole at the edge of a big field of ice and snow. His food is the whale. Thunderbirds fly out to the ocean, catch a whale, and hurry back to the mountains to eat it. One time, a whale fought Thunderbird so hard that during the battle trees were torn up by their roots. To this day, there are no trees in Beaver Prairie because of the fight that Whale and Thunderbird had that day. One of the most interesting aspects of the legend is that the Qualiute mention the Great Flood in their description of the battle between Thunderbird and Whale. All of the above-mentioned legends describe the Thunderbird as a very large, powerful creature that makes thunder and lightning. Myths from all across the world tell of magnificent birds that were sometimes known under a variety of names among ancient cultures. We'll learn more about the shape-shifting Thunderbirds coming up. Also, the Skeleton Man of the Hopi Indians, when Weird Darkness returns. If you like what you're hearing on Weird Darkness, Please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Have you heard the whistler? I'm the whistler. I must kill Henry. I must kill Henry. That was Ambrose Bren, official of an airplane plant. He found strange notes in the night. You better get away, Ambrose. Take a good long rest. The sooner the better. That was Henry Pierce, Ambrose's partner. He was growing fearful of Ambrose. Get this prescription filled, Ambrose. It'll make you sleep. And you'd better get away. And that was Ambrose's friend, Dr. Fenwick. And this is Ambrose's wife, Doris. What happened, Ambrose? Look at me. What have you done? Another Saturday night, and again, CBS presents The Whistler. And I, the whistler, know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, many secrets hidden in the hearts of men and women who stepped into the shadows. I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. So I tell you tonight the strange story of Notes in the Night. A storm rages wildly over the countryside. Beyond that long row of trees stands a lonely house half hidden in the darkness of the night. Not a single light appears from any of its many windows. But up there in that room with a large window, a man stirs fretfully in his sleep. The man is Ambrose Brent, an official of an airplane plant. 
But it's not the storm that stirs his uneasy slumber. It's something else, something far more sinister, something that has happened many times in the past few weeks. Now he stirs again, moans loudly, and suddenly sits bolt upright in his huge bed. Who's there? Who's there, I say? It's funny. I swore I heard something. I swear I felt someone in the room. Turn on the lamp, Ambrose. You'll see. I can't imagine what's happening to me. It's just nerves, I guess. It's just... Good Lord. Another note. Another one. I must kill Henry. I must kill Henry. That's the third note this week in my own handwriting. I've got to do something. I've got to tell someone. Henry's my best friend. Oh, it's nerves. I know. I'll call Dr. Fenwick. Doc will know what's wrong. A Fairchild uh, 1834W. Yes. Hello? Is uh, Dr. Fenwick in? Walnut 2380. Walnut 2380. That's, that's Henry Pierce's number. I can't go there. If there's anything to this, I must stay away from Henry. I've got to see Doc Fenwick. Wait till morning. Doc, I, I've got to talk with you. Well, of course, Ambrose. Why not? What's up? Something's wrong with me. Terribly wrong. Oh, yeah? Read this note. Note? Hmm. I must kill Henry. Henry? I must kill Henry? I don't get it. What is this to do with your trouble? I wrote it. You did? Well, really? And uh, why did you write it? I don't know. I don't remember writing it, but I know it's in my own writing. And that's it. Who's Henry? Henry Pierce. Who else? <clears throat> Have you been drinking, Ambrose? Not a drop, I swear. Well, uh, look, old boy, you'd best sit down. Ah, that's better. Now, uh, when did you write this? I don't know. I found six notes just like that. Six? Where? On the nightstand beside my bed. Are you sure it's your writing? Well, doesn't it look like it? Yeah, it certainly does. Uh, tell me, how many hours have you been putting in at the plant lately? Oh, too many. I'd better give you a thorough going over, Ambrose. But why should I write such notes? I don't know. Mine plays queer tricks on us sometimes, under undue strain. You'd better slow down. That's my best prescription. Take it easy. Get out of town as soon as possible. Yes. Yes, I guess you're right. Here, I'll give you something for your nerves. Thanks. Doctor, you... You don't think I'm losing my mind. Do you? No, Ambrose. You're just terribly upset. So, ah, yeah. Here's your prescription. You better get it filled tonight. Thanks. I'll leave Saturday. You don't think there's anything wrong with me? Mentally, I mean. <laughs> if you're in town after Saturday night, I'll drag you out with my own two hands. Good night, Doctor. Good night, Ambrose. Sleep tight. And uh, don't think about anything. Why don't you take a little vacation? What do you mean, Henry? Have you been talking to Doc Fenwick? Fenwick? Of course you have. He told you all about it. About what? I feel better than I've felt in years. I'm in excellent condition. Do you hear? Yes, certainly I hear. What's wrong with you, Ambrose? Nothing. If you act like this, I'll be forced to agree with Doc Fenwick. What has he said? He just said you were overworked. Well, he doesn't know everything. Ambrose, you'll please me very much if you'll take a little vacation. Did Doc Fenwick tell you what was bothering me? Yes, he did, Ambrose, and I think you'd better get away as soon as possible. Oh, I'm sorry, Ambrose, but don't worry. Everything will be all right. Then you... You're not worried? You're not upset about it? Certainly not. Why should I be? Please believe me, Henry, I wouldn't do such a thing. I, I've never even thought of such a thing. I'd kill myself first. You... You do believe me, don't you? Huh? Well, of course I do, of course. I wouldn't kill you. I have no reason. Shall I... Drive you home, Ambrose. No. No, I'll get home. 
I'd better leave tomorrow, hadn't I? I'll go up to my place in the mountains. There's no one there. My wife has gone to Palm Beach. Yes, Ambrose. You better leave tomorrow. Yes. Doris will be back from Palm Beach in three weeks. That'll be long enough. I'm sure you'll find things different when you return. Quite different. Good night, Henry. Goodbye, Ambrose. Sleep tight and don't think about anything. Ambrose goes home and to bed. The clock ticks off the eerie hours. The clock chimes two. And suddenly Ambrose stirs fretfully in his slumber. He wakes and again sits up staring into the inky blackness of his silent room. <laughs> Turn on the light, Ambrose. Turn on the light. Who is it? Who's there? Good Lord. Another one. I must kill Henry. Jameson. Jameson! I've got to get hold of myself. This is ridiculous. Jameson! I'm losing my mind. I must be. Did you call me, sir? Yes. Yes, I called you. I thought I heard a scream. A scream? No, I... Uh... What time is it? It's long after midnight, sir. It's two o'clock. Two o'clock? Oh, pack my bag. Order my plane to be ready in 30 minutes. Where are you going, sir? It doesn't matter. Uh, yes, sir. I've got to get away. I've got to. 2.15. I must get away. I must. I'm mad. I must be. Jameson! Jameson! The, the car is at the door, sir. Then come on with the bag. Where are you going, sir? I don't know where I'm going, Jameson. Understand? Yes, sir. I understand. Good night, Jameson. Goodbye, sir. <laughs> Is that you? What on earth are you doing here at 2.30 in the morning? What's wrong? I say, what's wrong with you? I must kill Henry. I must kill Henry. Ambrose, put up that gun. No, no, don't, Ambrose. Don't. I must kill Henry. Don't, you're mad. Don't come near me. Don't. Ambrose. <laughs> I want Dr. Fenwick in New York. Fairchild, 1834W. Please. It's uh, Dr. Fenwick's residence. Uh, make it person to person. Uh, this is Crestline, 142. I've got to talk to someone. I've got to. I can't stand this... this silence. This, this being alone. Hello? I see. No, no, never mind. I'll call tomorrow. Put up your hands. Don't move. Doris. Ambrose. What on earth? What are you doing here? Why, I... what are you doing here? I thought you were in Palm Beach. What are you doing up here in the mountains? I changed my mind. I decided to come up here. Why didn't you let me know? I didn't think about it. I was going to phone you in the morning. Well, how did you find time to get away from the plant? I thought you were too busy to eat. Well, I... Uh, I decided I needed to rest, so I... Uh, it's an early hour to arrive. 5 a.m. Is it? Well, you... Uh, you see, it occurred to me on the spur of the moment I, I flew up. Well, what are you staring at? I'm not staring, Andrew. What's wrong? What's happened? Nothing. Uh, I came up here because... Because What? What are you talking about, Ambrose? Are you ill? Yes. Yes, that's it. I'm ill, very ill. Yes. Get the doctor. 
What doctor? There's no doctor near here. Get Dr. Fenwick. He knows. Dr. Fenwick? He's the only one who knows. Except Henry. Are you out of your mind? No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. Do you hear? It's a lie. A lie. I'm not crazy. I won't be crazy. Oh. Oh, Doris, what's happened to me? What's happened? Oh, poor Henry. <laughs> Ambrose, look at me. What have you done? What have you done? Let me alone. I'm going to bed. I want to get some sleep. Uh, I've done nothing. Nothing. What's that? Wake up, Doris. What? Hmm? That noise. I didn't hear him. I did. Hear it? There it is again. There's someone coming there. They are at the door. There's no one. You see? I'm not here. I haven't been here. You don't know where I am. Do you understand? Yes, yes. I understand. Doc. Doc, it's you. Oh. Hello, Doris. Hello, Doctor. Did you get my call? You did, didn't you? Now, Ambrose, take it easy. Everything's going to be all right. Don't get excited. All right? What do you mean? You've got a 50 to 1 chance to pull out of this. Pull out? Certainly. I know you're mentally upset. You have been for weeks. I'll swear to that. I have records. I'll appear on your side. You'll get out of it. Out of it? Out of what? You're not a killer. Killer? What did you say? What did you say? I said you weren't a killer. I understand your case perfectly. Yes. I'm sorry to say Henry is dead. He died about 2.30 in the morning, as closely as can be determined. From all indications, the police think he committed suicide. But he didn't. He didn't. You know he didn't. He may have. Then why did you come here? I thought this is where you'd come, and I was right. What does this mean, Doctor? It means that if Henry's dead, I killed him. I must have. Must have? Are you positive? Yes, who else could it be? I've written notes to myself for weeks. This doc knows. He, he knows all about it. Do you? Yes. But I didn't think it would come to this. But why did you do such a thing? He was your best friend. I know it. Dead, I, I must have done it. But why did you do it? I don't know. No, no, please. Please, don't get upset. He wasn't responsible. I am responsible. I did it. And I'm going back. No, Ambrose. Stay here till I send for you. I have a talk with you. No. I'm going back this morning. I can't believe such a thing. Doris, why do you look at me like that? Please, I, I don't know why I did it. Oh, Doris, don't you believe me? I... I don't know. I don't know. Tell her, Doc, tell her. Tell her what? Tell her the truth. Tell her I didn't do it for a reason. Explain to her how it was. You know how it happened. Go on, tell her, tell her. Come now, old boy. This is not helping you. What will I do with you? Why? Well, now, look, it's, it's early yet. It's nine o'clock. You'd better try to get some sleep in this afternoon. I'll take you back to the city and make arrangements for you to go someplace where you can have a nice rest. What kind of a place? Why, uh, rest home. I know a nice, quiet place. You don't mean a rest home. I know what you're thinking. You mean an asylum. You think I'm insane, both of you. Now, now, Ambrose. Well... Why don't you say it? Ambrose, if you don't control yourself, something will happen to you. I won't go on a, to an asylum. Do you hear? Do you hear me? Stop it. I won't stop it. You don't care about me. You're both cold and heartless. You want me to be locked up, both of you. Ambrose, please. Please, calm down. Keep away from him, Doris. You see, keep away from him. He's a dangerous lunatic. A killer. You don't calm down. I'll have to use force. You try it. You just try it. I'm going out that door, and don't you try to stop me. You run away like this, you stamp yourself as a hopeless lunatic. They'll find you. They won't find me, and I won't be locked up. Ambrose, please. No, I'll kill myself first. You're a fool, Ambrose. A mad fool. really made a mess of things. <laughs> You're a fugitive now, 
they'll throw out a dragnet. You'll have to run and hide and sneak, afraid of every shadow. You'll have to run, Ambrose. Hide and sneak and run for the rest of your days. <laughs> Ambrose Brent, <laughs> fugitive. Hurry, more gas. Step on it. What's that? A sign, Ambrose, and a red flag swinging in the road. Two men in black rubber coats. Too late to turn around now. What's your hurry, mister? Driving pretty fast for a storm like this, ain't you? Who are you? What do you want? State police. What are you stopping me for? We're stopping everybody. Why? We're looking for someone. Looking for someone? Who? A fugitive. A murderer? We didn't say what he'd done. Let's have a look at your driver's license. Driver's license? Why, uh, I, uh... That's funny. I must have... I left it in your other suit, huh? <laughs> Step out. Let's have a look at you. Hey! Hey, you! Come back here! What's eating him? He must be nuts. Why, well, I could have plugged him, but I just shot in the air. Just as well. He wasn't Mike Coretti. Mike could make two of him. Know where you are now? Recognize this room? That's right. It's the room of death, where Henry was murdered the night before. His body has been removed, but the pad on his desk is still there, smeared with a large brown stain. There are five people in the room, Dr. Fenwick and Doris Brent, Jameson the Brent's butler, Inspector Fields, and Carnes of the district attorney's office. The inspector is speaking. District attorney Carnes had an appointment with Henry Pierce. It was he who discovered the body this morning. Pierce had been dead about seven hours. Right, Mr. Carnes? That's right, Inspector Fields. We attempted to reach Mr. Brent and were told by Jameson, the butler, that he'd left town at two in the morning. He told us about the place in the mountains, and uh, there we reached you, Mrs. Brent. You've no idea where your husband is, Mrs. Brent? Not the slightest. Your butler said you had gone to Palm Beach. Yes, I started for Palm Beach, but I changed my mind and went to the mountains. And your husband came there last night? Yes, it was about five in the morning. Nine o'clock. I flew up to the cabin, got there a few minutes before nine. Why did you go there, Doctor? Well, I advised Ambrose to take a rest. He's been working too hard and was heading for a nervous breakdown. When I learned of Henry's death, I went to tell him about it. Doctor, you visited Henry Pierce here last evening. I did. He phoned me to come over. I got here about eleven. He'd made a new will and wanted me to witness it and asked if I would serve as executor. I read it and signed it. I see. In whose favor was the will drawn? Well, the old will left everything to Ambrose. Henry had no living relative. But because of Ambrose's mental condition, he decided to leave everything to Doris, Mrs. Brent. That's correct. I found the will on the desk. Was Ambrose Brent your patient? Yes, of course. What was his trouble? Too much work. He had a great responsibility. Did you think he was losing his mind? No. Did he think so? Well, he was terribly upset. He'd been having hallucinations. Doctor, when was the last time you saw him prior to finding him in the mountains? The evening before Henry died. I wrote him a prescription. Mm -hmm. And where did you go after you left Henry Pierce last night? I told my servants that I was going out of town for a holiday, but it was storming so when I left Henry that I decided to stay at my club. Mrs. Brent, did your husband and Mr. Pierce ever quarrel? Not to my knowledge. They were the best of friends. I see. Have you told us all you know, Dr. Fenwick? No. Then I think you should. What was it that bothered Ambrose Brent? Well, he said he had been writing himself notes. They were all alike in his own handwriting and all said the same thing. I must kill Henry. I didn't know this. Certainly not. 
That was the patient's private business. I thought that if I could get him away for a rest, he'd pull out of it. There you are, Carnes. Must have been on his mind. Yes, but what's the motive? An unbalanced mind that doesn't always need a motive. Then you think Ambrose did it? He loved Henry like a brother. If he did it, he was completely out of his mind. Believe me. Ambrose! What? Well, thank heaven you finally came to your senses. Come in, Mr. Brent. I suppose you want to see me? I'm Inspector Fields, Police Department. This is Mr. Carnes of the District Attorney's Office. Yes, I know, Mr. Carnes. I thought you'd gone on a little vacation, Mr. Brent. I had gone, but not on a vacation. Mr. Pierce told me you'd gone for a couple of weeks. I was gonna, uh, going on a vacation, but something changed my mind. Oh? What was that? You know. You know why I've come back. Henry's dead, and I killed him. When did you kill him? I don't know. Must have been last night. Why did you do it? I wish I knew. I recall neither the crime nor the motive. But I'm sure I did it. Why are you so sure you did it? Because of these notes, six of them. I've been writing notes to myself for weeks. Read them. Are they... Are they in your own handwriting? Certainly. But I don't remember writing a one. I must have some form of amnesia. Mm Hmm? When I heard Henry was dead, I... I tried to run away. I couldn't stand the thought of an asylum, but... The faster I ran, the more I hated myself, so I came back to get it over with. It's a great relief. Now, now, Mr. Brent, pose yourself. Mr. Brent, did you know that Henry Pierce made a new will last night, leaving his estate to your wife? What? Why should he do that? Perhaps he was worried about you. Of course. Why shouldn't he be? He knew I was acting strangely. Take a look at this will. Is that Henry's signature? Certainly. You're sure it isn't your right? It is not. I couldn't copy his signature if I tried. It's just a bunch of scrawls. Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, Mr. Brent, uh, take this pad and write on it, I must kill Henry. Please, isn't that being a bit brutal? Go ahead, write it. There you are. Good. Now write the date. They weren't dated. Well, write it anyway. Write the date in numerals. Don't name them up. There it is. Thank you. Now, you write the same, Mrs. Brent. There. Thanks. Now, you, Dr. Fenton. There you are. Mm-hmm. Well, the notes you've got were certainly in your own handwriting, Mr. Brent. I told you that. Why waste so much time? I came back to get it over with. I'm tired. There, there. You need some sleep, old man. You'll feel better after you had a nap. I can't sleep. I haven't slept for days. You should have. You've been taking that medicine I gave you. I didn't get it. I didn't want to sleep. I, I just wanted to get away. Here's the prescription still in my pocket. Prescription? May May I see it, please? Thank you. Hmm. What is this medicine, Doctor? It's intended to induce sleep. But he's so stubborn, he wouldn't take it. If he had, this wouldn't have happened. Inspector, take a look at this note written just now by Mr. Brett. I must kill Henry. And the date. 5-14-42. May the 14th, 1942. Now, Mrs. Brent's note. I must kill Henry. 5-14-42. The same. Mm -hmm. And now, Dr. Fenwick. I must kill Henry. 14-5-42. Now read the date on the will. 14. 14542. What does that mean? There aren't 14 months. Now look at the date on this prescription. 14542. Well, I'll be darned. What does it mean? It means that Dr. Fenwick was educated in Europe, where they indicate the day of the month first, then the month. The 14th day of the fifth month. What? Are you crazy? Are you accusing me of this? It means that the doctor, not Henry, wrote this will, and if he wrote the will, he must have killed Henry Pierce. And if he killed Henry, he must have had a motive. And I've guessed that motive. Are you out of your mind? What motive would I have? You also wrote those notes and left them for Ambrose to find. You're an expert at handwriting, Dr. Fenwick. You figured that Ambrose would be declared insane. And Henry's, as well as Ambrose's property, would go to Doris with you as executor in complete control. I don't believe it. Ridiculous. And this is what I hate to say at this moment, but I think it's true. Dr. Fenwick, tell him about you and Mrs. Brent. That's a lie. Tell him, Doctor. That's what's back of the whole thing. You're stuck. You might as well tell him. All right. 
All right, I wrote the will. I wrote the notes. I am in love with Doris. I have been for years. She was in love with me. Doris. I'm, I'm sorry, Henry. But she had nothing to do with Henry's death. Not a thing. I came here that night disguised as Ambrose. Henry didn't hear my voice. I only whispered. He thought it was you. That's all. Sorry, Doris. Stop it! Stop it! Good Lord. Uh, well, the doctor is dead. The doctor's dead, yes. But that's not all, not quite. There's something troubling the inspector, and you, Ambrose, and you too, Doris. How was it that Mr. Carnes first got wise to the doctor? How did the doctor slip up? How did he show his hand? I know. And so does District Attorney Carnes. Go ahead, Mr. Carnes. Tell us. Well, the doctor said he had gone to the cabin to tell Ambrose of Henry's death. He arrived at the cabin at 9 a.m. I didn't discover the body till 10 a.m. and gave strict orders that it was not to be announced until we'd inspected everything thorough. Therefore, the only way the doctor could have known about the murder was to have been present when it happened. So you see, the doctor didn't go to the cabin to inform Ambrose. He went there to meet Doris. And when he was surprised by Ambrose, he used the death of Henry as an excuse for his coming. <laughs> CBS has presented The Whistler. Original music for this production was composed and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. Tonight's Whistler story was written and directed by J. Donald Wilson and originated from Columbia Square in Hollywood. Next week, same time... I, the Whistler, will return to tell you the incredible story of the draft of death. Good night. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Nothing goes better with chocolate than vanilla, and nothing goes better with the darkness than vampires. So we've combined all of them into a new blend of weird dark roast coffee called Very Vampilla. This bloody good blend combines a medium dark roast coffee with hints of chocolate, vanilla, and just a tad bit of dried cherry, too. So good, you'll want to sink your fangs into the fresh roasted bag itself. Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla, the only thing at stake – sorry, not sorry, bad pun – is your dissatisfaction with your old coffee. Sip it while the sun is down if you're one of the undead, or when the sun is up if you just feel dead and need a bit of a boost. Get your Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Welcome back to Weird Darkness. I'm Darren Marlar. We now continue to learn about Native American lore when it comes to shape-shifting thunderbirds on Weird Darkness. Many mythological birds were believed to have had supernatural powers. Adarna, a beautiful legendary bird of the Philippines, was said to change its colors after singing seven songs. This magnificent bird could restore health but also turn a creature into stone. The ancient Chinese have interesting stories about a nine-headed bird, Zhu Feng, one of the earliest forms of the Chinese phoenix. Mythical fiery bird phoenix is mentioned in Roman, Greek, or Egyptian mythologies. The incredible phoenix is a symbol of the sun, immortality, rebirth, resurrection, and eternal life. 
This mythical creature has also its counterpart in China, Japan, and India, and in each of these cultures many appearances of phoenix have been created, but all of them have similar significance. They are also all alike. Birds have always been mysterious creatures and close to the gods, and the powerful thunderbird was one of them. Other thunderbirds are spoken of in northeast North America, around the state of Maine, Pamola is a snowbird spirit in mythology of Abenaki or Penobscot indigenous peoples. In ancient beliefs of these people, Pamola, which means he curses on the mountain, is said to be the god of thunder and the guardian of Mount Katahdin, or the greatest mountain, in the highest mountain in the U.S. state of Maine. The thunderbird is a large avian creature, widely known and worshipped among the indigenous people of North America. This legendary bird, most commonly found in folklore of Arizona in the southwestern United States and a close relative to the phoenix, could create storms. Numerous stories tell of a gigantic bird that creates the sound of thunder by beating its huge, strong wings. Sheet lightning is said to be the bird blinking, and lightning bolts are made by glowing snakes which the bird carries around with it. The Thunderbird is often described as having horns or even teeth within its beak. The Penobscot people have their Thunderbird. The creature, known as Pomola, is described as having the body of a man, the head of a moose. In some legends, Pomola's head is as large as four horses and powerful wings and feet of an eagle. In another oral tradition, Pomola was the storm bird with powerful wings a head as large as four horses and with horrible beak and claws. The legendary bird is associated with snow, night, wind, and storms. It was definitely not a creature any human being would want to mess with. When people heard a noise like the whistling of a powerful wind, they knew that Pomola was flying not far from them. The bird was both feared and respected by the Penobscot people. As Karadin was the adobe of Pomola, the natives avoided climbing the mountain and considered this activity as taboo. There was a belief that the spirit disliked mortals interfering from down below. As Henry David Thoreau, an American philosopher, essayist, poet, and historian who explored the mountain and the beliefs of the Penobscot Indians of Maine wrote, Pomola is always angry with those who climb to the summit of Karadin. In Algonquin myth, the legendary bird Pomola is an evil spirit eventually conquered by Glooskap, a trickster god and a mythic hero. One story is about a man who went to the forests at the foot of the sacred mountain and was caught in a heavy snowstorm. The only thing he could do was to appease Pomola. He burned offerings of oil and fat until the god of thunder himself appeared to take the offerings. Surprisingly, Pomola was not angry and thanked the man for his respect and generosity, and took him to his sacred abode inside of Mount Kadadan, where he lived in comfort with Pomola's family. He even married Pomola's daughter, but on one condition. He was not allowed to marry anyone else, or else he would be taken prisoner inside of Mount Kadadan for good. Unfortunately, the man didn't heed the warning when he came back to his tribe. He disappeared, and no one ever saw him again. Another story tells about a woman who constantly persisted in refusing to believe even in the existence of Pomola, unless she witnessed him with her own eyes. One day she was on the shores of the Lake of Ambactictus near Mount Kadadan on the southwest side. Pomola appeared and took the woman to his home inside the mountain. She stayed with him there for a year and was well treated, but powerful Pomola made her pregnant. Then she left his abode and returned to her home, carrying Pomola's son. Pomola warned her not only to never remarry but also warned her of their son's supernatural and frightening power. The child could point at any living thing with his right forefinger and it would die instantly. He advised the woman to keep their son apart from society until the age of manhood, but her fellow villagers wanted her to remarry. She refused explaining that Pomola was her husband and in case of marriage, she and the child would be taken back to Mount Kadadan. No one took her words seriously, though, and soon she was remarried. But in the evening of her marriage day, 
when all the Indians from her village were gathered together celebrating the marriage, both she and her child vanished forever. The Hopi Indians' encounter with Massa was very emotional and frightening. His physical appearance was so horrifying that many of the Hopi Indians ran. Some of the Hopi had the courage to stay because they'd been looking for him for such a long time. They wanted to listen to Massa and receive spiritual wisdom. The remarkable encounter with Massa is one of the reasons why the Hopi are today considered keepers of sacred knowledge. The Hopi Indians have a very rich mythological tradition stretching back over centuries and have stories about their ancestral journeys through three worlds to the fourth world where the people live today. According to Hopi legends, Massa is a spirit that cannot die and he was therefore appointed to be guardian of the underworld. He is described as a skeleton man and lord of the dead in Hopi mythology. Hopi mythology tells about the existence of worlds before our own. All previous worlds were destroyed because people became disobedient and lived contrary to Tawa's plan. Tawa is the sun spirit and creator in Hopi mythology. There are different versions of how the previous worlds were destroyed and who managed to survive. Some legends tell that the third world was destroyed along with all evil people but other stories reveal good inhabitants were simply led away from the chaos which had been created by their actions. When the Hopi emerged into the fourth world, our current world, they learned that Massa was on Earth and they went looking for him. People who wanted to escape from the third world decided to make contact with Massa. First, they sent a swift bird looking for Massa, but the bird was so tired when it reached the sky that it had to come back. Then the Hopi tried to send a dove and later a hawk, but both creatures failed to reach Massa. The one that succeeded in finding Massa was the catbird. Massa asked him, why are you here? The catbird said, the world below is infested with evil. The people want to come up here to live. They want to build their houses here and plant their corn. Massa said, well, you see how it is in this world. There isn't any light, just grayness. I have to use fire to warm my crops and make them grow. However, I have relatives down in the third world. I gave them the secret of fire. Let them lead the people up here, and I will give them land and a place to settle. Let them come. Massaw looked like a skeleton man, a stick person, and he was a fearsome sight. When the Hopi Indians accepted Massaw's frightening physical appearance, his attitude began to change, and he gave them wonderful knowledge. Massa explained to them how they should live and allowed their people to flourish. The guardian spirit Massa gave the Hopi permission to settle in the region that is now northwest Arizona. Massa noticed that greed, ambition, and social competition were dominating factors in their former life, and this lifestyle made people very unhappy. Massa warned the Hopi, that the life he had to offer them was very different from what they had before. To show them, Massa gave the people a planting stick, a bag of weeds, and a gourd of water. He handed them a small ear of blue corn and told them, here is my life and my spirit. This is what I have to give you. Massa explained that if they followed his way, they would live long and fruitful lives. He wanted them to be humble and live like he did, with only a planting stick and seeds. He wanted the Hopi to take care of and respect the land, and they did what he said, despite the fact that their manner of living was not easy. Dry farming in the high desert of northern Arizona, relying only on precipitation and runoff water, requires an almost miraculous level of faith and is sustained by hard work, prayer, and an attitude of deep humility. Following the way of Massa, the Hopi people have tended to their corn for nearly a millennium, and the corn has kept them whole. 
For traditional Hopis, corn is the central bond. Its essence, physically, spiritually, and symbolically, pervades their existence. According to the Institute for Tribal Environmental Professionals, a tribal training and support organization based at Northern Arizona University in Flagstaff, to be Hopi is to embrace peace and cooperation, to care for the earth and all of its inhabitants, to live within the sacred balance. It is a life of reverence shared by all the good people of earth, all those in tune with their world. This manner of living lies beneath the complexities of WIMI or specialized knowledge, which can provide stability and wisdom, but when misused can also foster division and strife. Deeper still in the lives of traditional Hopi people lies the way of Massa, a way of humility and simplicity, of forging a sacred bond between themselves and the land that sustains them. Massa's way is embodied in corn. The source of true happiness is to live in peace and harmony with nature, animals, and other people, according to Massa. The Hopi followed his teachings, and they lived peaceful in communities, caring for each other for centuries. They always carried within them the knowledge of the Great Spirit, and they performed sacred rituals daily. The word Hopi is a short version of their name, Hopitu Shinumu, or the peaceful people, or peaceful little ones. The Hopi Dictionary gives the primary meaning of the word Hopi as behaving one, one who is mannered, civilized, peaceable, polite, who adheres to the Hopi way. The tribe does live up to the name. The Hopi are a very peace-living people, and they have managed to keep their culture intact thanks to the sacred knowledge given to them by Massa, the Skeleton Man. When Weird Darkness returns, we look at a trickster god that we know as the Coyote, but Native Americans see it as something much, much greater. Do you keep a journal or a diary? If not, maybe you should consider it. It's been shown that journaling can help you reduce stress, help relieve depression, builds self-confidence, it boosts your emotional intelligence, helps with achieving goals, inspires creativity, and more. In fact, my friend S. Ann Lanise has created a Weird Darkness-themed journal just for you, full of blank pages for you to use as a diary, make notes for class or office meetings, Jot down ideas for that novel you want to write. Use it for keeping a mileage log if you travel for business, whatever you want. In fact, she has numerous styles of journals to choose from. Along with the Weird Darkness Journal, there's one for dealing with grief, for teacher's notes, for medical residencies, keeping track of your meds or health routine, and several others. Journals make a great gift for others, but it's also a great gift for yourself and your own mental health. No matter what you might want a journal for, my friend Anne has it, and you can see all of her journals, including the one for Weird Darkness, on the Sponsors and Friends page at WeirdDarkness.com. Strange Wills Stories of Strange Wills Made by Strange People, starring the distinguished Hollywood actor Warren William, and featuring Loreen Tuttle and Howard Culver, with the original music of Del Castillo. I devise and bequeath to my heirs the seven deadly sins, pride, envy, hate, jealousy, anger, despair, and greed. And here is Warren William. These are the stories of strange wills made by strange people. Men and women who defy and defile every moral law of respectability and decency to satisfy a mad desire, to right an imaginary wrong that burns like a raging fire in their shriveled souls. Strange wills are stories based upon actual wills gathered from courts all over the world. Names, places, and time have been changed so that no reflection can fall on any person or persons, living or dead. Only the sin 
remains. Deadly sins that cry out from the depths of the grave for vengeance. You'll presently see what I mean, but first, a word from your announcer. Now back to Warren William as John Francis O'Connell in The Mad Concerto. This is the story of a woman who voluntarily became a prisoner of love because of greed. It's not a nice story, quite the contrary. Mad Concerto is the story of a beautiful woman who gave up every feminine and human desire for the power that goes with dollars. Ten million of them. It happened a short while after I'd begun the practice of law in an eastern city on the Atlantic seaboard. I remember I was standing near the window of my office, looking out over the myriad of skyscrapers. Oh, how I craved excitement. How I prayed for one case to pull me away from the small, inconsequential work that is a young lawyer's lot. Perhaps I prayed too hard because... Mr. O'Connell speaking. Mr. O'Connell, you don't know me personally. But many years ago, I retained your father as my lawyer, and I have every reason to believe that I will find you just as sincere and trustworthy. Well, thank you, sir. Don't thank me. I haven't done anything for you yet. Yes, sir. Have you a pencil handy? Yes, sir. Mr... Then take this address down. 127 Kingsbury Road. Have you got it? Yes, sir, I have it. 127 Kingsbury Road. I want you here at 10 o'clock tonight. Come prepared to draw up a last will and testament. My last will and testament. I expect you to live up to every vow of privacy between client and lawyer. Oh, of course, sir. That goes without saying. Good. My matter is urgent and, well, let's say, unusual. My name, Mr. O'Connell, is Walker. J.C. Walker. Good day, sir. Had I heard correctly? Walker? J.C. Walker? No, it couldn't be true. Why, J.C. Walker was one of the richest financiers in America. Retired, he'd lived abroad and had recently come home. Why, my prayer was answered. I was excited. I tried to go back to the ordinary office routine, but the clock on the wall stood still. I'll never forget how long that day lasted. At exactly seven o'clock, I got into my car and began the long 60-mile trip to the country estate of my client. I was tingling with anticipation. Uh, you, you can't drive in there, mister. Private property. I'm looking for 127 Kingsbury Road, Mr. Walker's residence. Uh, what's the name? O'Connell. John Francis O'Connell, attorney at law. Oh, yes. Go right in. Mr. Walker is expecting you. Thank you. I drove up the long driveway and stopped at the Walker Mansion entrance. Come in, please, Mr. O'Connell. Mr. Walker is waiting for you. He's in his study on the second floor. Thank you very much. As I entered the door, I stopped. It was like a beautiful dream come true. I mean her, of course. She was sitting at a concert grand piano, completely engrossed in her music. She was exquisite, something out of a picture book. She had a wild, barbarous look. And her blonde hair seemed to keep tempo with the strange, savage music she was playing. As I passed her, she glanced up for just a fleeting moment. And I saw she had brown eyes. Eyes that seemed to probe deeply into my soul. She held me with a long and tense look and then... I lowered my eyes and followed the servant up the stairs. Who was this strange creature? 
This most beautiful, most sensuous of women. Even the scent of her exotic perfume reached out like tentacles of doom and encircled me. Unfortunately, I was to learn later. Glad you're here, O'Connell. Sit down over here by my desk and go to work. Thank you, sir. I feel very honored. Don't be. You may yet rue the day I called you. Drink? Yes, thank you. Here's to a momentous night. And to your health, Mr. Walker. You gave me a hollow toast, Mr. O'Connell, because my doctor has given me just two weeks to settle my affairs and die. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not unhappy about it. I've made millions, had everything. It's time to let someone else have a chance. Now, here are the bequests I've made. They're all down here on a slip of paper. All but one. And that's what I want to talk to you about. Mr. O'Connell, you saw Nadia playing the piano as you entered, didn't you? Oh, yes, sir, I did. I think she's very unusual, very lovely, very... Mr. O'Connell, you're out here to draw a will. Yes, sir. O'Connell, I love Nadia. I love her because she is a genius. I recognized her unusual talent from the first day I met her in Vienna almost nine years ago. I'd read that Nadia Winter was making her debut at the Wilhelmstrasse Theater, and I attended. Yes, and stayed to worship at the throne of genius. Never in my life had I seen such technique, such warmth and feeling... I remember as she was ending her final number. I left the theater before she had taken her final bow and took the liberty of going backstage to make her acquaintance. Yes? My card, Miss Winter. I hope you'll pardon this intrusion, but as a sincere lover of music, I could not refrain I'm from... I'm very thankful for your interest, Mr... Mr. Walker. Won't you sit down, please? Yes, thank you. I won't detain you for more than a moment. Perhaps you'll be made happy with what I have to tell you. What? It's simply this. I'm old, retired, rich, and frank. And you might add interesting, too, Mr. Walker. Be that as it may... I want to tell you that your work tonight has impressed me tremendously. So much so that I want to help finance the completion of your musical studies here in Europe. And later I will arrange a series of concerts for you throughout the United States. Oh, Mr. Walker. Quite frankly, Miss Winter, I consider you a potential genius. And your talent belongs to all of us. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Walker. I am just a bit confused. All this, it's, it's so unexpected. Of course, I realize only too well that a professional career in music is long and tedious and quite expensive as well. There need not be the slightest objection to my offer, Miss Winter. You may rest assured that your private life will remain your own. I will consider your offer in the same frankness in which you have given it, Mr. Walker. Please let me think it over for a day or two. I, I, I'm staying at the Terra House. Call me later in the week and you've been very, very kind. As you can surmise, Nadia finally accepted my offer. I engaged the finest teachers for her, both here and abroad. Through the years, I think she grew to love me. Oh, not me personally, perhaps, but rather that innate sense of security that clings to wealth. Yes, Mr. O'Connell, this is a strange love that has borne strange fruit. I intend to perpetuate it. I want to die knowing that she will never love another man, that her every living breath will be devoted to her music and to my memory. Forgive me, Mr. Walker. I wish to withdraw from the case. Some other attorney... Nonsense, O'Connell. You're just infatuated with Nadja. All men are. It will pass. Nadja will see to that. Nadja has one weakness. She loves power. Needs it in order to successfully concentrate on her career. I honestly think she would sell her soul for power in order to accomplish her goal. This is my only chance to hold her. And I'm going to do just that, even though it's from my grave. The last bequest in my will, Mr. O'Connell, is one to you for ten million dollars. To me? Ten million dollars? Ten million dollars to be held in trust by you for the use and benefit of Nadia Winter. She is to receive the entire income for the rest of her life, so long as she lives here in this house, alone, and never marries. But, Mr. Walker, you can't be serious. On the contrary, I was never more serious. This girl has one of two choices, to live in luxury the rest of her life... Enough to satisfy her every whim and aspiration, or to fall in love and lose her genius. What she will ultimately do rests in the lap of the gods, 
and in the green-eyed monster of greed. The will of James Carlson Walker was duly signed and executed three days later. And none too soon, for true to the doctor's prediction, J.C. Walker did not live beyond the following week. Nudge knew nothing of the trust. So I was instructed by the testator to advise her of the fact the day after the funeral. As I was admitted into the Walker residence, Nadja Winter was again at the piano, and her music more emotional, more savage than ever. She didn't hear me enter, and I stood quietly in the darkened shadows of the room. As the music swelled to a crescendo... Oh! I beg your pardon, Miss Winter. I am Mr. O'Connell, John Francis O'Connell, attorney at law. Mr. Walker asked me to come here and uh, discuss certain business matters with you. Oh, please sit down, Mr. O'Connor. And pardon me for not hearing you enter. I was lost in, shall we say, a musical thought. Thank you, Miss Winter. Please don't be so formal, Mr. O'Connell. Call me Narcher. Oh, it would make me happy to. Mr. Walker told me just before he died that you would come to see me. Nadja, Mr. Walker has been exceedingly generous with you in a queer sort of way. I don't understand. He was always most kind and considerate. I don't know if his bequest to you was either kind or considerate. But he was determined that it should be final and absolute. He was always unusual, Mr. O'Connell. That is what made me love him. I never knew what to expect next. Nadja, I am trustee over a fund of a considerable amount of money. Ten million dollars, to be exact. You want to receive the entire income from this trust as long as you... Well... Oh, come, John. It can't be as bad as that. As long as you live in this house, alone, and never marry. As long as I live here in this house, alone, and never marry? Yes, Nadja. But if you prefer to leave or marry, the money is to go to certain charities. I don't know what to say. Or do. He has made me a prisoner. A prisoner of love. And ten million dollars to form the bars of my cage. <laughs> but I want money. I want power more than anything the world or life can offer. And ten million dollars will get it for me. I'll stay, Mr. O'Connell. Yes, yes, I'll stay. And I'll get everything I want from life. Everything. You wait and see. <laughs> Part two of Strange Wills follows in just a moment. And now back to Mad Concerto and Warren William. For the first few months, I saw Nadja regularly. She seemed gay and carefree, and her music was light and restful. Then, quite suddenly, I noticed a change. The transition was abrupt. There was a distinct violence in her mood, as if a storm was brewing. I decided to have a serious talk with her for more than one reason. Oh, John, I don't know what I'd have done without you these last two years. But why must it be for only two years, Nadja? Because that's the way I've taught myself to live. Never to look beyond the horizon. 
And especially where you're concerned, Mr. Counselor. Nadja, I came over this afternoon to have a serious talk with you. Well, darling, haven't you always found me to be a good listener? Yes, that's the trouble. You listen very dutifully, and very beautifully, too. But somehow I never win my point before this lovely court of law. You simply won't conform to my pattern of reasoning, will you, John? No, because it's fallacious, Nadja. Now listen to me for a moment. For two years you've been working over eight hours a day on nothing but music. You've become a machine. Oh, why won't you... Give up my inheritance and marry you? You've said it a thousand times before, haven't you, John? Yes, I've said it a thousand times, but only because I love you, Nadra. I've loved you from the very first day I entered this house. I can't believe that your career is more important than a happy marriage, especially when you're forced to live alone. Alone like a prisoner in this house. I do it from preference only, John. You see, I don't think you understand my temperament. I am an artist. My whole life has been devoted to one principle, to forswear the world for music. Don't think I'm the first to do this. Oh, all the famous composers have sacrificed in one way or another their devotion to create. I am no different. I eat, sleep, and love, to be sure. But never for a moment do I forget why I am here. My music will one day be my monument. Your love for me, my affection for you, must remain secondary and without hope of fulfillment. But can't you see you've been changing, Nadja, and not for the better? Oh, John, don't you realize the hopelessness is... Oh, a... darling, you're young and beautiful. Your money's a curse that's not only permeated your body, but is affecting your soul. I beg you, let me turn it over to charity. Marry me now, Nadja, before it's too late. Keep your career. I'll do everything in my power to help you reach your goal. Oh, for the love I bear you, Nadja, now, today, let's end this nightmare of horror. Stop! Stop! I'll not listen to another word. John, I have never really loved a human being. I have not the capabilities. I love only attributes in others. I love James Walker because he represents power, which to me is the greatest thing in life. And you too, John, I have love for your kindness and your understanding. Sometimes I wish that... But it's useless to discuss it further. You are a lawyer retained by my benefactor to carry out the provisions of a trust. I cannot, I will not ask for counsel or advice. My life is mine to do with as I choose. Hereafter you will mail my check. And I ask you not to come back until I send for you. I see. I see I'm too late. Goodbye, Mr. O'Connell. Goodbye, Nadja. The savage way she turned to the piano horrified me. I left with a heavy heart. Yes, Nadja was losing her battle. Her power had been purchased at the price of freedom and sanity. I rode back to town deeply depressed. I saw no more of Nadja for many years. Eighteen, to be exact. Her check was mailed regularly, and I'd heard rumors to the effect that she'd entirely withdrawn into herself and permitted no one to enter her home. Even tradesmen were required to leave their wares on the steps. Then, early one winter morning, it must have been round two o'clock. Huh? Oh. Hello? Mr. O'Connell. Mr. O'Connell, this is Nadja. Nadja Winter. Do you remember me? Oh, Nadja. You haven't once been out of my thoughts these many years. Come out right away, Mr. O'Connell. I have something of the utmost importance to discuss with you, and I want you to come alone. And please hurry. Please hurry, Mr. O'Connell. I'll be out there as fast as my car can get me there. In 20 minutes, I'd left the city behind me and was making 60 over ice and snow that begged for caution. In memory, I was reliving the years. The last time I'd seen Nadja, she was young and breathtaking. But greed had been her bedfellow and power her counselor. I wanted to see Nadja again more than anything on earth. I left my car at the gate and trudged through the snowdrifts to the house. 
As I approached the once beautiful and ornate mansion, I could hardly believe my eyes. The front porch had crumbled. Even the steps had rotted away, leaving gaping holes in the foundation. The windows were broken, and the holes stuffed with paper. I climbed up and pushed against the door. It responded grudgingly to my touch. (laughs) Nadja was at the piano, just where she'd been the last time I'd seen her. An old frayed dressing gown partially covered her gaunt, thin body. Her blonde hair, now streaked with silver, ran riot over her shoulders, looking like a thousand coiled serpents. Suddenly, she turned and looked up at me, and then I saw her eyes. Their soft brown luminousness had turned to stark, cold madness. She held me in her stare, much like a cobra holds its prey. The blood left my face. I was terrified by what I saw. Sit down, Mr. O'Connell. Things have changed a bit since you were her last, haven't they? Nadja, I'll call a doctor. You need help. (laughs) Medical and spiritual help. No, Mr. O'Connell, I don't need help. I sent for you for a very special reason. As you know, years ago, I gave up the world and its pleasures. For money. And for power. I wanted money because it gave me a chance to create. I wanted power because it would make the world listen to my music. All these years I've created... My music lies here in these boxes. It will live after me because you, you are going to publish it. Tonight, tonight I am giving my last concert. It is my greatest creation of all. I call it Concerto Finale. And you, Mr. O'Connell, shall be the first... To hear it. First, to hear it. The music started out softly, tenderly. It sounded like the sparkling water of a murmuring brook as it danced lightly along on its way through forest and glen. I imagined it to be the early childhood life of Nadja, when youth was gay and filled with the laughter of crowded childhood. But in the next movement, I noticed a perceptible change. There were flashes of uncontrolled emotion breaking through to disrupt the calm tranquility of the theme. The tempo increased. The chords became discordant. It sounded like the cry of a distressed soul crying out for deliverance. Nadja was looking straight ahead looking into the darkness and the gloomy shadows of the room. But I knew she was looking far beyond. She was reliving her life. And the poignant sorrows interspersed with happier moments had all been interwoven into this, the bitter end of her musical career. And now she'd entered into the final tragedy of her life. The wild notes shrieked into the room and blended with the moaning of the winter wind. I shuddered. Never had I heard music played like this before. To me, it seemed as if all the diabolical imps from Hades were striking the keys through her fingers. It was the discordant lamentation of the damned. I wiped the perspiration from my forehead in spite of the cold within the room. I must help Nadja and save her music at any cost. Quickly, I formulated a plan. While Nadja was lost in her mad revelry, I'd slip out and phone for medical assistance. I hoped she'd keep playing until I could return. I arose quietly and slipped out of the door and ran down the long, snow-covered path to my car. I could still hear Nadja's music as it swept along in its mad theme of abject misery and despair. Just as I was about to enter my car, I heard a dull rumble come from the direction of the house. I looked up. Great soaring fingers of flame were shooting heavenward. The house was on fire! Even as I hurried back, I knew I was too late. Like something out of Dante's Inferno, this house was becoming the funeral pyre of Nadja and her music. Through the crackling of the flames, I still heard the piano. Nadja was ending her mad concerto. Then, quite suddenly, the whole house collapsed like a tortured soul!
And so ended the mad concerto. A girl genius, the lust for power, and the green-eyed monster of greed. But the sin did not die with Nadja Winter. It lives on in the hearts of men and women, secret and unconquered. Warren William will be back in just a moment to tell you what the official records say about the probate cause of the Mad Concerto. But first, a message from our sponsor. again is Warren William. And the fire? The records simply say fire of unknown origin. Was it accidental? Could it have been a human sacrifice at the pagan altar of greed? Who knows? For greed is the cause of endless suffering. What would have happened to Nadja Winter, I wonder, if she'd been able to live a normal, carefree life and still retain her genius? Perhaps the two are incompatible. I don't know. Do you? Next week, I'm going to tell you the story behind one of the strangest wills ever written. We're all familiar with the splendid results of modern psychiatry. But when you mix a mad, covetous psychiatrist together with a lovely, beautiful woman who has a husband, well, you've got a situation. We call this unusual story alias Dr. Svengali. This is Warren William inviting you to listen again next week. Ken Crippen and directed by Albert Ulrich. This is a Telaways feature produced in Hollywood. Are you a member of the Darkness Syndicate? The Darkness Syndicate is a private membership where you receive commercial-free episodes of the Weird Darkness podcast and radio show, behind-the-scenes video updates about future projects and events I'm working on. You can share your own opinions on ideas to help me decide upon Weird Darkness contests and events. You can hear audiobooks I'm narrating before even the publishers or authors get to hear them. You also receive bonus audio of other projects I'm working on outside of Weird Darkness. You get all of these benefits and more starting at only $5 per month. Join the Weird Darkness Syndicate at WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. I'm Darren Marlar. Welcome back to Weird Darkness. We now continue with Native American legends and lore on Weird Darkness. 
Coyote. The trickster god is a well-known figure in myths and legends of indigenous peoples of North America. Coyote, a mischievous, cunning, and destructive force at work within creation, was also assigned to the role of God Deceiver, a great cheater who misleads people and animals and finds obvious pleasure in causing troubles and upsets on a daily basis. Among the many tribes of Native Americans, there is a belief that Coyote is the bearer of all evil, brings winter and even death. The Maidu people of Northern California, for example, portrayed Coyote as deceitful, greedy, and reckless, and these obvious failings in his character make problems to people around him. His impulsive and foolish behavior causes him to suffer as well. Frequently, he is killed through his own carelessness, but in some way, amazingly, he always comes back to life afterwards. Still, the coyote remains a very prominent animal, and the basis of his character is the same in all myths. Only a few character traits of coyote vary from region to region. Other tribes claim the opposite and believe coyote is the teacher of wisdom, the trickling god who, when properly approached, can share with people some priceless wisdom. Many native myths deal with this amazing creature, the most sacred and at the same time most profane of animals. Coyote's power is to make people free or to feel fear. Among many Native American tribes, the coyote is credited with bringing humanity the gift of fire, the destruction of monsters, the making of waterfalls, and the teaching of useful arts to the Indians. But perhaps the most famous and fascinating incarnation of this remarkable creature is presented in the Nez Perces tribe's myth of Coyote and the Shadow People. His actions lead to humankind being forever separated from the spirit realm of the dead. As we look deeper in Coyote's character, we realize that the creature's cunning tricks are not always trivial ones. His mischief is not so much to deceive us from our goal but rather to show how ridiculous we often are in our lives and suggests we have to take a bit of distance to ourselves and think about what we really do with our lives. Unlike the coyote, we cannot come back to life if we are killed. By looking at coyote's foolishness, we can avoid making mistakes and find a straight road with a purpose in our lives. Coyote is sometimes a creator, sometimes a clown, destroying things for himself and others who surround him. Because of his vanity and boastfulness, the coyote undertakes various ambitious enterprises in which he fails due to his passions. Is it not the same we experience in our lives sometimes? Coyote has been compared to both the Scandinavian Loki and also Prometheus, who shared with Coyote the trick of having stolen fire from the gods as a gift for mankind, and Anansi, the great trickster of West African legend which was originally credited with the creation of the world and became a cultural founder hero. In the Aztec pantheon of gods, there is the trickster and transformer, the old coyote, that shares many characteristics with the trickster coyote of North American tribes. In Eurasia, rather than a coyote, a fox is often featured as a trickster hero. For example, in the Japanese mythology he's known as Kitsune, and in medieval folklore of Europe there is a similar figure known as Reynard the Fox. Terror began in January by the light of the full moon. The first scream came from the snowbound railway man who felt the werewolf's fangs ripping at his throat. The next month, there was a scream of ecstatic agony from the woman attacked in her cozy bedroom. Now, scenes of unbelievable horror unfold each time the full moon shines on the isolated main town of Tarker's Mills. No one knows who will be attacked next. But one thing is sure, when the full moon rises, a paralyzing fear sweeps through Tarker's mills. 
for snarls that sound like human words can be heard whining through the wind, and all around are the footprints of a monster whose hunger cannot be sated. Cycle of the Werewolf by Stephen King Hear the entire novel absolutely free on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. of the eerie, weird, blood-chilling tales told by old Nancy, the witch of Salem, and Satan, her wise black cat. They are waiting, waiting for you, now. folks up with another of our pretty little bedtime stories. So if you tell everyone to doubt their life, we'll get right down to business. Oh, no! That's it. No! <laughs> we want lots of gloom and shadow for our comforting little yarns. Now, go up to the fire and gaze into the embers. Gaze into them deep. And soon you'll see a famous land that's spurred across the sea. A land of sphinxes and a pyramid. The land of Egypt. And there, far out upon the desert, some modern Englishmen are digging up the buried temple of an old-time god who's been forgot two thousand years. And so begins our story about the priest of Set. <laughs> the priest of Set. <laughs> Work, you fellows. For the love of heaven, put some muscle in that jaw. Hurry, I tell you, hurry! Uh, you've been in Egypt long enough to know that one can't hurry a native digger. Well, I'll go mad with curiosity if they don't finish the job soon. <laughs> we'll go to the madhouse together, Clyde. For I'm as eager as you to learn what lies beyond that entrance. Well, you two boys come over here and stay. Sit down and be patient. How can we be patient, Sir Richard? I know. I found it difficult enough on my first expedition to Egypt. But you'll soon become accustomed to delays and disappointments after a while. I realize Bart and I are merely tired, but with all your experience, I can't understand how you can be so calm. Why, we may be on the verge of a discovery greater than Lord Carnarvon. I scarcely think so. We shan't find the tomb of a Tutankhamen behind that fallen stone, son. We're merely unearthing the sanctuary of a small and very unimportant temple. But the chamber behind that stone won't be a ruin like the rest there. And we'll find it in precisely the state it was 2,000 years ago. You said you're fairly sure of that yourself. Yes, my theory is that this entire temple was suddenly buried by one of the desert storms. That's the moon, perhaps, which wrenched that huge stone from its place to block the sanctuary entrance. If we're not the first to discover it since that time, we're certainly the first to have tried to move away that barrier. Someone may have been trapped in the chamber when that stone fell across the doorway. That's possible. But finding a skeleton or two will not advance the science of Egyptology. But don't look discouraged. We'll find something interesting inside, I'm sure. If those lazy beggars would only hurry up their work, Lord, yes. <laughs> I remember that feeling from my younger days. 
I say, it doesn't look as though the shoring timbers are very secure where those chaps are working. They do look sort of wobbly, don't they? If they gave way, the sand would slide and block that entrance all over again. Then we'd have to wait until they unearthed it the second time. I'll give orders to have them spent in the work. He's me! He's me! Try, they move the stairs. They free the enemy. can go inside the chamber. Oh, come on, Sir Richard. I'm wait. coming. Have you got your flashlight? Yes, I have mine. So have I. Here we are. It's your right to go in first, Sir Richard. Clive and I will squeeze through together. Not through this narrow passage. They've only moved the stone about nine inches from the wall. Move aside, you men. Move aside and let us by. Hurry, Sir Richard. Hurry. We're right behind you, sir. Well, don't be right behind me and stop pushing. We've got to wait until the dead air clears out of that chamber. It does smell awful, doesn't it? Of course it does. It was imprisoned there before Caesar was born. Well, it's not so bad that we can't stand it, sir. This is our first time, sir. Can't we go in? All right, follow me. Oh, I say. I'd squeeze between this stone and wall. We should have the men move it a little more. Oh, that'll take more time. Oh, there's room enough. For you young, slender chaps, yes, but I'm middle-aged and fat. <laughs> Hold your flashlights before you. It's pitch dark beyond. <sighs> I'm through. What do you see inside? A oh, hurry, Clyde. And we can fit. I'm through. Come on, Bob, and look. Look there. What? What? Good Lord. That giant statue. It's of the lion-headed goddess Thicket. Perfectly preserved. This is a find worthwhile. Look, on her lap. Bones. A human skeleton. Oh. Someone was in prison when that stone fell. Yes, but not alive. Beckett was known as the Destroyer. She was a goddess to whom human sacrifices were made. When we climb up for a closer inspection, you will find those bones are a young woman. For lion-headed Beckett demanded virgins as her victims. The lap of this statue is undoubtedly covered with ancient bloodstains. I'm going to climb up now. Wait, wait, Clive. Look over there. I say. Another statue fallen to the floor. It isn't a statue. It's the body of a man. Yes. And preserved like these statues in this airtight room. Now don't touch it. This change of atmosphere may make it crumble into dust. The shriveled flesh looks firm and hard. Like leather, sir. It does indeed. Perhaps some chemical emanation from the sand has mummified it. Mm. He was imprisoned here alive when the stone fell. And he is sir. Poor devil, he's lying prone before the figure of Nefer Tum. His arms outstretched in an attitude of prayer. He died beseeching the God whom in his faith granted life. There's irony for you. His dead face is peaceful. As though he thought at the last his God had heard his prayer. I... I think his face is horrible. Yet... Yet there's something fascinating about it. You're right. It's rather difficult to take one's eyes away. He must have been a chap of a strong character. He exerts power even in death. I... I don't like to look at him. Now here's proof that those bones on second left are the remains of a sacrifice, Sir Richard. A sacrificial knife is clutched in this dead man's hand. I do. That means this fellow was the temple priest, a priest of second. He just put that girl to death, perhaps when the stone fell before his door. If that is so, what? why should we find his body perfectly preserved and hers is nothing but a skeleton? That is queer, sir. Say, it is. Well, don't touch him, Clark. I wasn't going to, sir. I was just looking closer. Somehow I, I have a peculiar feeling about him. As though, as though he isn't really dead. Not dead? After several thousand years? Crazy idea, isn't it? <laughs> of course he's dead. Dead was the gods he worshipped. The gods he thought his power to let him live. Let's get out of here. I can't be close to him any longer. Clive. Oh. I've got to get out of this chamber. There's something in here I can't stand. Uh, I fancy I'm a little sick. Sick? The air in here is pretty bad, sir. It's affected Clyde, apparently. Bad air, eh? You're getting the wind up too, Barton. Because of a mummified dead man. No, sir. No, I know I'm not afraid, sir. It's only that... Oh, I can't explain. Don't no, try to explain, son. It's a spooky-looking place with these statues, that heap of bleached bones, and this dried-up dead man on the floor. And I was once young and impressionable myself. Please don't think I'm a booby, sir. We'll go outside. Let the air freshen up a bit. Get some better light than these torches for our second visit. 
Then you'll begin to enjoy our fun. You go through the passage first, Clyde. I'll follow you, Barton. I'd rather come last, sir. After making an ass of myself. As you prefer. Don't block the passageway beyond this, sir, you workman. Yes. I'm coming out. Yes, you Betty. What are you going to take, Clyde? I said I'd leave last. After acting the fool. All right, old man. Come on, you boys. Come I'm on. coming, sir. I'm coming. Hurry up, Clyde. No. I'm going back into the chamber. You'll think I'm afraid. I'll show you. Oh, Clyde, don't be an ass. I'll show you another boogie. I'll show you. Go and fetch that young idiot, Barton. Yes, sir, I'll get him. Look out. They're breaking the fence sliding. There they go. The entrance is blocked again. Clyde Ward in that chamber. Thank God you turned back in time. You'd have been trapped in that passage. But Clyde. Clyde. Clyde, are you all right? Clyde, can you hear us? Clyde, Clyde. Oh, thank heaven. Ellie Bay, you men. Spades and Marcus, quick. Clear this stand away. It'll be a two hour job to free this entrance again. Give me a shovel to come on. Yes, run to me. And don't worry, Bart, we know that Clyde is safe. This experience will do his good. The boy's all have been too highly strung, too imaginative. By the time we get him out of here, I'll wager that he'll never show fear again of any dead Egyptians. What's that? Everyone stop digging. It's Clyde! He's screaming. Help! He's screaming for help, sir! There's nothing in there to hurt him. I'm not so sure. I felt as he did in that ghastly room. I felt something was there besides the dead. We're coming, Clyde. Now dig you men and free this passage. <laughs> yes, dig. Dig. Dig as you've never done before. <laughs> now dig, dig, will you? Oh, we'll never free this passage. It's almost clear now, boy. We'll reach Clyde in half a minute. But what shall we find when we reach him? Since those spiteful screams, we haven't heard a single sound. Nothing could have happened to the chap, I tell you. He may be ill. Unconscious from the bad air. Bad air wouldn't have caused his shrieks of terror. Oh, I don't know what caused them, but... Hey, baby, you can go through now. Oh, now we'll find out. Come on, sir. Now I'm right behind you. Clyde. Clyde. Clyde, you're here, then. We're coming after you. Clyde, tell us you're all right. He doesn't love us, sir. I reached the chamber. Pass me your torch. I've forgotten mine. Can you see him now? No, the room's so big and the light so weak. Clyde. Clyde. There he is. Kneeling before the goddess's statue. And he's alive. He's getting up. Thank God. Clyde, you're all right. Why did you scream? What happened to you? Clyde, why don't you answer us? Uh, he looked at us as though he didn't understand. What's the matter with you, Clyde? Sir Richard, look at his eyes. He stares at us as though we were utter strangers. His eyes are queer. I can... Yes, they draw mine away from them. Nor I. It's the same sensation we experienced with that mummy. Good oh, Lord. The mummy's gone. Crumbled into dust and bone. Yes. But what's happened to Clyde? Our old man, we're your friends. Why won't you talk to us? Tell us why you screamed. Why do you look at us without a word? Why did we find you leaving before that lion-headed goddess? Why? He doesn't seem to understand, sir. No. What on earth happened to it? What has happened in this room? Barton, what had happened to your friend? What's going to occur in the old temple chamber? Go, Mr. Story. Well, it's as great a mystery now as it was that day almost three years ago. You see, Clyde's memory was completely blotted out. Complete a failure, the doctors call this condition. Unfortunately, it was quite strange. Not mad, as we feared at first. And who's the man you're taking me to meet? Uh-huh. If this taxi doesn't break down, you'll meet him within the next five minutes. What's more, he's going to be best man at our wedding, now that you've finally joined me. <laughs> nice state of affairs when a girl has to journey all the way from London to Cairo in order to get married. Yes, but you journeyed on a nice, comfortable ship. Think of me. I traveled from the Nubian desert on Camelback and Nile Steamer to meet you. And arrived only yesterday. And I've been here 24 hours alone. And that was the camel's fault, not mine. But now, let's turn right the next corner for New Zealand, will you? Yes, he's thank you. Tell me some more about this client. Well, we had a pretty tough time with him for nearly a year after we let him from that chamber. 
You see, he couldn't comprehend anything that was said to him. He had to be taught like a child to speak his mother tongue once more. He'd forgotten his own language? Completely. Sounds unbelievable, doesn't it? Yes. But I suppose anything can happen in Egypt. He's quite until now, of course. To be employed in Cairo Museum, he must be. Yes, his memory isn't completely restored by any means. That portion of his brain, which contained recollections of his previous life, doesn't function at all, it seems. But he speaks English again with a strange accent. And Sir Richard writes me that his scholarly attainments are greater than ever were before. In fact, he's become the museum's most valued expert on ancient Egyptian customs and hieroglyphics, which is rather funny. Clive was always a trifle dumb about such things before his shock. Well, we're at the museum now, and there's no more time to talk. Uh, take us to the side door, driver. Yes, Mr. Kinsey. Oh, what a beautiful museum it is. Well, I was also surprised to find Cairo so up to date. Oh, we're very 20th century here. I see by this morning's paper that the town is even having a modern murder sensation. The killing of all those young girls, you mean? I read about that back in London. Well, it was news to me when I arrived this morning. We don't get newspapers in the desert, you know. Over a dozen girls have been reported missing during the past year. Yes. They found several of them cast up right on the Nile. Each one stabbed to the heart with a knife that left a queer shaped wound. Oh, well, some madness is found in that place. Well, here we are. Let me help you out, huh? Oh, thanks. This should pay a fair dollar. You mean it, right? Oh, very grateful, Jenny. Very grateful. Very grateful. Now, this way, darling. The client and Sir Richard will probably be on the lookout for it. You certainly aroused my interest in your friend Clyde. Well, look out for his hypnotic eyes. Well, the most curious thing you've told me about his changed condition. Yes, you'll find that effect no stopping at first, but it wears off after a time. Well, here we are. We turn left for Sir Richard's office. Oh, what magnificent thing. You haven't seen anything yet. Our temple group has been set up in the north wing, just as we found The entire sanctuary with all its contents. And my name's in the catalogue as one of its discoverers. Oh, Virginia. That's Clyde and Sir Richard coming down the hall. Is that tall, dark man, Clyde? Mm-hmm. Come on, dear. Wait. Dark me, he doesn't look as though he were an Englishman. He resembles those old statues about us. Oh, yeah. Seems his face has acquired an Egyptian cast since I saw him last. I don't like his face. I don't like his eyes. Oh, Bart, don't leave me alone with him. Oh, Virginia, darling. Why, he's the best fellow in the world. Bart, oh, my boy. Oh, hello, Sir Richard. How are you, Clyde? We saw you leave your taxi from our window and came to meet you. Clyde, old man, you are looking great. Pardon, my friend. I am glad to see you once again. Oh, very sorry, you here. Miss Prescott, allow me to present Sir Richard Knox. Sir Richard? It is a great pleasure, my dear. Mr. Clyde Foley. This is my fiancée, Virginia. Virginia. That is a beautiful name. I... How do you do, Mr. Poulton? I suppose we all go to my office where we can sit down. Well, if you don't mind, sir, let's look at our exhibit first. Miss Prescott has never seen it. I'll wager you've told her enough about it, though. It's down this corridor. You lead the way with Miss Prescott, Clyde. Barton and I will follow. Oh, can't, can't we all go together? Barton and I will be right behind you. We shall lead, as the gentleman so kindly permit, Miss Prescott. May I offer my arm? I... Thank you. Come, Miss Prescott. You and I. Yes. You and I. Hmm. I see your fiancé is no exception to the general rule. What do you mean, sir? That everyone on meeting cried for the first time since his change displays some evidence of fear. <laughs> I tried to prepare for it, but I had to fight the old feeling myself. Any change in his condition since I saw him last? None, excepting that his new personality becomes more dominant each day. The lad we knew three years ago might as well be dead. Sit down here, Barton. Oh, but I say so. We said we'd follow directly. I kept you behind on purpose. You're the only person I can talk to, son. I want to do so without delay. You look worried, sir. What's wrong? Have you heard anything of the recent epidemic of murders here in Cairo? Young girl. Why, yes. But I have a theory concerning these killings. I have learned that every one of the murdered girls had announced her forthcoming marriage shortly before she disappeared to be cast off later by the Nile. Oh, I can't see why you concern yourself with these crimes, sir. You recall the skeleton we found on the lap of our huge statue of Thicket? Yes. It was that of a young girl. For the ancient deities required a sacrifice of virgins. Barton, 
I believe fresh blood is being poured upon the lap of Thicket the Destroyer. Well, don't mean on, on... Shortly before the first of these strange recent killings was discovered, the sacrificial knife we found in that sanctuary was stolen from the museum. The knife of their priest, Henry? Yes. And a peculiar wound in the bodies of these poor girls was made by that knife. By the knife of the priest of Thicket. You suspect somebody. Who? We'll talk about that after you, Clyde, and Miss Prescott have dinner with me this evening. But you must think there's something we can do, or you'll never... There is something we can do, I hope. But there's no time to talk further now. Clyde and your fiancé are returning. (laughs) She's laughing. You see, she's already lost her aversion for him. I wonder which was best. Her previous fear or present freedom from it. I don't understand you, sir. You may, after we talk tonight. But I... Right. Th- They're almost here. You two delayed so long we returned to touch you. Mr. Pilkins can tell me all about your lying here with Goddess, Martin. He says she's beautiful. And Miss Prescott has been telling me that tomorrow she will marry you, my friend. I envy you the wife with such a pretty name. Virginia. <laughs> Quietly. We haven't aroused any of the watchmen yet, and we mustn't. I feel as though I were a criminal, sir, skulking through this museum at midnight. Why have you insisted on bringing me here to talk about those murders? Because you will demand proof of what I shall tell you. And here, tonight, I think you shall have it. Your revolver is handy. Yes, in my pocket. And I can still have a shilling at fifty paces. Sarton, you are the only one I can depend upon for the thing that must be done. Look, sir, I, I'm tired of listening to riddles. Stop here. This is to be our hiding place, directly in front of our sanctuary pile. The moonlight from that window floods it. We shall see whatever happens upon the lap of second. But, but what will I... I crouch down behind these papers. <laughs> oh, very well. I'll keep your voice down. The watchman has just finished his round in here, as it isn't due for another hour. Our expected guest is aware of that, I think, and may appear at any moment. I'll be still. Let... The reconstructed sanctuary of ours looks almost as ghastly in this moonlight as it did when we first found it. There are only three things lacking in this reconstruction that we saw that day. The skeleton, the sacrificial knife, and the long-dead priest. The two last of these I expect to see again before we leave here. You expect to see the dead priest? His body crumbled into dust. Yes, his body. But the priest of Second himself has been with us these three years. What do you mean? He's still. And listen. Something's moving. Yes. Look there, in the shadow. A man. In the priestly dress of ancient Egypt. Look at his face as he crosses that strip of moonlight. Good Lord. It's Clyde. Yes. But not the Clyde we knew. He's dead. You're looking at a thief. Who bears a stolen body? Oh, so rich, you're mad. Am I? Watch. Do you think that Clyde, our Clyde, would kneel before that statue of the lion headed goddess? He kneels there praying. What do those images he worships represent? Continuance of life, reconstruction of the dead, and above them all, Hecate the Destroyer. In Clyde's form, her priest lived on to serve her thirst for blood. But the ancient gods had no power, sir. The idea was to represent a superstitious lie. You see, you felt their power in that man's compelling eyes. But you have a greater power, a greater magic than any he commands. That's why I brought you here tonight. Well, I, I have power, magic. Yes, the greatest of all. And you must call upon it now with all your strength. Get your pistol ready. For here's the victim you must save. A woman's coming through the shadows. Her arms are stretched as though in a trance. She's answering his summons. Held captive by his spell. Sight your pistol on his heart. And look, she steps into the moonlight. It's Virginia! He told you about. Shoot quick and shoot to kill. Yes! Oh, his eyes! I can't pull the trigger! I can't move! Nor I! Virginia! Stop! She's going to him. Oh. 
Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves old-time radio or the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. All stories used in Weird Darkness, aside from the old-time radio shows, are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the authors, stories, and sources I used in the episode description. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me for this episode of Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. Retro Radio.